Love, love. We are live. I think we're live. Is this one? Yeah, we're gonna have to so was the darkness okay? Uh, this is what it looks like right now. I, I just, uh, mm -hmm. so no objects can be. So we need to be more light. And we don't have like, no microphone, so hopefully it's gonna be recording. Not recording, but okay. Nice. So I was thinking we could, um, if we have like a Cord extension cord sort of extension. thing, then we can cut, we can cut the computer from one of our own things. We can have like a little, uh, well, so I'm gonna actually put it right here and then we're gonna cut it. So cut oh, yeah? Uh, Is that too far? Uh, I can bring the cord. I just need a few people to make sure we. No, it's, um, this, uh, this needs to go back anyways. So. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, no. Real quick. Four people watching right now. Hello there, four oh, people. Oh no! <laughs> Welcome to the setup stage of our TV studio. Your critique. Did you set up? Sorry. Yeah, it's just, um, here, can we just have it? Yeah, I'll just, no, no, it's fine. I've got it. Yeah, you got it already. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Cord would be great. It's so funny in here, <laughs> like five seconds later. <laughs> It's on delay, I see. Mm. Let's see. I'm 
wait and see if he's in his <laughs> Maybe you can put it uh, beside the camera. Like you can do this, but uh, yeah, and I don't want to just completely, yeah, we road will block, completely here. block it. But um, or you can put it on top. Of, uh, actually, no, it it'll tilt. Right. Where it's are you getting your sound? Uh, from this, yeah. Yeah, so you're gonna get a big fan noise. Mm. Um, let's see. Is that one? That. Mm. Is that the, oh, that's, oh, that's separate.
doing maintenance on that projector. So we use one of our projectors. Are you serious? No, that's what Justin always uses. What? Justin, when he does the man tech. No, but we came here, Ryan and I came here and checked with the technician, and he showed us how to do that. Move out of the way. Thank you. 
I'm not even where um, I run this. I want to go over here. So we put it back here. Oh, we usually put it on a, a, a usually goes on a stool. Okay. Are you playing me? I could ask Matt Bird all this equipment. So are we putting it here? I have one of those.
Um, hi guys, my name is Anna Bjorkson. 
I'm interested in environmental studies as well as industrial design. Um, so for my thesis, I focus on local eating and how we can help the environment through the way we eat. So I'm going to start with the problem. Um, problems that more than half of our population actually lives in cities, which means that people are extremely disconnected from the environment and where their food comes from. So people that live in cities, where do they get their food from? Usually it's from a supermarket, a restaurant, the kiosk, takeout, you know, you're super disconnected from the farm and who is actually producing it. Uh, so to put this to a test, I asked a few of my peers to take these grocery items and place them on the map where they think they come from. And most people, almost everybody, put everything in North and South America, mostly in North America, when really these foods are shipped thousands, thousands, thousands and thousands of miles from across the world. People have no idea that this is happening. I was, always so, I was also curious to know if people know what's in season right now, so I asked a few of my peers to circle what's in season in the state of Rhode Island in the month of May. And people were super hesitant to, they really didn't know the circle, and as you can see, the um, answers were kind of all over the place. So after doing some research, I came to the conclusion that uh, understanding where your food comes from and how it's made is prepared to shift people's mindsets about the food. And only then will it influence them to eat locally and seasonally. Because if you just feed people local and seasonal food, and they don't know why they're eating it, then it's really not going to ferries across the world and airplanes um, during the winter time. And also through my research, I found out that there's three types of people when it comes to environmental problems. So there are the people that are passionate about the environment, people that are kind of in the middle, kind of skeptical, and those that are just completely uninterested. And with this project, I hope to aim towards the people that are skeptical, because with more information, we can shift them into the passionate realm, and then eventually get to uninterested people over here. So I have a question, and that's where uh, Beyond Rye comes in. And Beyond Rye means blackberry in Swedish, and I chose this group because it's made up of a bunch of smaller parts, kind of like a community where it would be made up of a bunch of smaller farmers and bakers that would feed one big community. So, we'll play this video. which um, you just answer some fun questions, and it would categorize you as a serious test personality. So for example, this one would be an indulgent butterfly. And um, then it would recommend grocery items and pair of rules, and you can shop for different things depending on whether you like to cook or if you just like to have somebody make for you. Um, then the food is delivered in a reusable tote bag like these. With your food personality on them, you can write about what you are or decide just to have one that says you're bad or I eat local. So um, then 
and you can cycle those bags once you order or continue ordering. And once you've sat down and unpacked your groceries, you can log in and learn about what you bought, what you purchased. So say you bought these eggs from Carl Family Farms. You can click by your farmer and see where these eggs were grown. Um, visit their website, see the farm, what else they have at that farm. You can also go and see your grocery track map. Your eggs have traveled 89.8 miles in the state, so pretty close by. You can also look at some local recipes and see what other to, I want people to take these bags to farmers markets and learn about who's in your community, who's growing their food, who else is interested, and just continue to build uh, this local food revolution and get people to get outside of their house in the supermarket. So um, if you want to figure out what your food personality is, you can go to the link below, um, your now or later, and then I also brought some biscotti pieces from a local baker, so you can pass them around. I just wonder whether you uh, considered social class before in your presentation. I didn't get a sense of that in your presentation. Yeah, well, I think it's like for where the project is right now, it's going to obviously have to start with those people that have the foods and are already able to spend a little bit more money on what they're eating. So you, I'm going to talk in the business perspective for a minute. You're entering a market that is actually really large and there are a lot of players in it. And, and I love the concept. I love the, the combining of sustainability and modern technology. I would love to see you dig deeper if you're going to move this forward. We think about how you connect from a major metro area to all those farmers um, and play into organizations already like Craigslist or Blue Apron or those sorts of places that are doing some of this work mm -hmm. and, and lay a transparency over what they're doing in the sense of your product. The concept is great. I just feel like you're entering a market that's super fresh right now. Yeah. Um, but you're playing into a desire and need for people to, to want to know more about their food and want to eat more locally. So it's it's kind of trying to figure out do you partner with somebody else? Do you, do you sort of pick a, a completely different direction? Or are you solely do that? Yeah, during my research, I found this, I found a lot of different companies. I looked into like Peapod and Plata and all of those. Um, and I found this one in Brooklyn called Good Eggs, and they kind of, they're exactly a local farmer's market online. So I really didn't want to redesign that round of it because they do it really well. And, um, they're only about a year old, so they're not huge yet. So I kind of wanted to do a case study on them and then do just not redesign the marketplace to kind of add more of a desire and just the more. But when you're shopping online, you could already see, you could choose places that are closer to you. Like if you're shopping before you get the bag, you could choose eggs that are from a place that is only 50 miles away versus like 90, for example. So you would be aware of it already when you're shopping online. But, I mean, it would be great to have some sort of physical, um, local aspect, not just the delivery. Even like, you know, what if there's a store, what if mine goes to our store? Like, 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 like,
was looking at this kind of in that realm of the short term, um, kind of to get to provide more information for those kind of skeptical people. And then once like the skeptical people and the very interested people are eating local and sustainably, then we can like bring in uninterested people after a while of um, of it being of it spreading. But I think just in the short term it's gonna be kind of impossible to get people that are super anti environment or believe in global climate change to buy a local and seasonal food. Yeah. You know, adding um, using the vehicle of the internet to try to connect people to where things come from is a little bit more than water for me. Yeah. Um, and so by adding a map and doing something that gets people to you know understand where it comes from is really I think really interesting and we if you were to take you know if we were to take two weeks off and come back to this, yeah. um, I'm really interested in how you because I'm sure you really thought about um, you know the supply chain and just like trying to sort of share One short town. what people get out of farming the market. Isn't that socialization aspect? Is it that I'm being seen by more local food and I have the money to give that to them and then use what I do?
style of cooking is valuable. And that led into us talking about personalities, because that was a big part of Autica's project. Um, and we kind of had these prompts of getting people to come up with their own personas. Um, and so they were labeling, like, what kind of vegetarian, um, <laughs> squirrel, which was um, Pachi, um, <laughs> healthy professional. The squirrel snacks on stuff, that's why it's a squirrel. Um, and then the, the last activity we did was this experience mapping. So asking people, what's a process that you do with food? And let's map that out to pick discrete parts that we can narrow in on as something that people want us to change. So the second collaboration was with Paul's project on thin film plastic recycling. This was a little bit different because the goal was Paul had these things as inspiration for um, well, um, recycling. We take the recycling workshop. What if it, we, we thought about okay, well, how financial collapse? I think are important in structuring these kinds of um, activities. So for example, in planning, I thought it was important to prepare multiple levels of engagement. While someone might be comfortable jumping right in and doing everything, some other person might need more direct um, instructions or might want to participate on more of a service level. And then um, they, with, in, in the actual process, of seeding with examples, people might not understand exactly what you want them to do unless you show it and do it with them um, one time or like have things around that they can see and connect the dots. So each of the tools that I made has its own card, um, which sort of explains how it's used or um, how you would design this tool for a particular process. Potential way to create a, a community of, of these tools like from designing from the all in and actually possibly doing some of the and the machine learning to understand some, some of these frameworks that, that you said you were learning yourself, that you could actually gain information from the other tools as well. I think that sounds awesome. <laughs> 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 a lot of my process too was I talked to people who were doing this kind of stuff and was like, oh, so that's like how it works. And um, I go and Lindsay and work with two of them. <laughs> I was curious about uh, when you have YouTube, about social networks, about other ways that are in between the cards in person and then the big stuff because at the end of the day, the part that designers bring to this is we have the tool, but we also have a social process and we have social skills that we lay on. So maybe, but it's all tied up in the product. And so how do you take the pun and extend it beyond? You get rid of both things. What are you left with? The pun project. So the pun project is a series of 14 images that of products derived from pun. Um, and they live online and in postcard format. So even though the answers are available, there's an appendix. There's a little bit of a note in getting there. So online, you reach this page, and it says, you sure you want to go down this road? I believe in you. And you have two options. You so say, you're right. I can do this. Take me back to the funder. I really need the answers. And what starts to get exciting is that of the 180 people who have visited this page, 90 of them clicked on your right. I've got this. Take me back to the pun. Which is great, because you see that people want to be challenged. We don't want to be spooned at these answers. And so, it sparks you think you would use, other than, you know, give contact to, I mean, Kevin Jankowski would love to use it, hands down, but what are other applications that you might be able to use beyond sort of the typical like thing? Well, I think that puns, you have the ability to, um, to talk about things that maybe are like, more uncomfortable. I said the top right word. Um, in that, like, this. Um, so this is something that was done by an illustration student, and they're menstruism, and so she talks about surfing the crimson, crimson wave. And so we're talking about our periods in a way that maybe we wouldn't be, and you can do this in a way that's clever and engaging, and it's funny. And we can use that humor to break different boundaries. And we can, so this is like a postcard application, and it's being an icebreaker, but you can talk about bigger themes with puns and make people, it's the idea of feeling comfortable and feeling like you can reach out to somebody who you don't know that that is pushing you. Yeah, I think like anecdotally, you know, with the Garrett linear advance, it comes through the bar. You're walking into the space and you know that this is starting and this is ending and so you feel it's kind of outside of your everyday life and so you feel more comfortable and like doing things you maybe normally wouldn't do.
better.
is that the wallet, I set it up with the constraint of having it circular so that it could be something that was made on a circular machine. So before I even started making the wallet, I started off with the flat pattern. Um, also, the machine, it was really important that it was beautiful because it was showcased in this video. It had, had this seamless experience so that um, the, uh, the viewer didn't, wasn't confused by what was going on. And um, also, the film had to really showcase the, um, obviously had to showcase the relationship between the wallet and the machine very well. So these are some of the um, videos that I studied. I have to do a lot of um, test videos and storyboarding before I jumped into that. Yeah, so um, that's it. And for validation, I'm contacting some of the product developers at Apple um, Soft Goods and also um, both of the other as well as as well as the product at the same time simultaneously. Uh, I do think there is a bit of a disconnect between where you started off with you know visiting a Chinese client and watching how they produce things on mass and then you know comparing that to say or an Apple for a luxury good producer who have the capability of producing in in the West uh, with artisanal craftsmen or with uh, highly specified machines. Uh, it'd be, I mean, because you, you sort of like went into the discussion of time model, sorry, time management, uh, and a bit of terrorism of how the Chinese actually produce this stuff, and everything is top down. Right. Whereas Apple and Hermes and probably Toyota and other companies worked on like a lean system where people at the factory line sort of feed back to the product rather than people from the top. So I don't know that. You might want to take the Chinese part out of the presentation right. and focus on artisanal and manufactured products that you know can be sold and designed around the product itself and not about taking something, shipping it across the world, being implanted in an infrastructure that exists and shipping it out. Right. The reason why this was actually interesting uh, to include Apple is because that's actually the factory that I was at over the summer. Mm -hmm. So um, although it is a little bit more fluid, I still saw there was a huge disconnect from um, role to role in terms of communicating information. Um, how do you want to communicate how this product is being made to? Um, so this video was made for the consumer, but the um, it was targeted towards the consumer, kind of as a like mix between like an El Pico video and the Hermes um, promotional videos, but. I think that these videos will also strengthen the internal workings of the company, and I would assume that everyone is a consumer also. So. Did you do any research on um, actually giving products to people and offering them something how this is made? Um, no, I didn't. I think, yeah, it could be interesting to actually try and understand that, and because there is the language of how certain materials convey how they are in fact created and that might be an interesting avenue to research to, to bring in that natural um, communication through the material and form and tie it in with the, the you know, human interaction machine process. Right, I, I think this is a little bit um, direct. I think it's, this is more of a descriptive product. Um, it's a little bit, it was a little bit direct in terms of communicating what the material I think it could have been a bit more um, poetic in terms of like communicating to your own theory, but during a lot of time and again, this was a lot of people that were Thank you. This is more of a comment, but <clears throat> I think it's very interesting. You made the machine in which you made this. Yeah. That was clear, and I think that takes it a step deeper that we don't often see. I see a Calvin Klein advertising handmade garments and his fantasies for rich people. <laughs> but to see, I mean, I made the connection. This person knows what she's doing. She even made the machine for it. And I think that's where it links to the process. And the whole thing becomes much more um, integrated. Yeah, that was very clear.
just to address the fact that there are alternatives. Um, I do think there would be a few problems in terms of how viable this is that <coughs> mass production. Um, but I think that you could see the like the factory workers being like um, one person working together, um, like many bodies working as a company, <coughs> and um, instead of having me sitting down and making everything, it could have been multiple people, and then they understand also the social relationship of them working together. Um, I think you. Um I think you copied the way in which uh, the you know Apple and, and other companies go about doing this, but I, I don't see how you were critical of like presenting kind of you know, like taking a product development in a way. You just kind of did, did, did it the same way that, that they do, and this kind of faceless, gratuitous, processy stuff, which is I love. But, um, I know, but um, I'm not sure. Thinking about actually creates a reaction with people who might think that, oh, you took some time to do this really well, so that means it's a good product. But like, if people believe that, like, you know, there's, there's such a big gap between the way Apple does it and the kind of one person small craft world, and to what degree emulating that Apple thing is actually the appropriate way to show the character and the person which you miss. I think um, my approach was that I wanted to focus on the human effort more, so I tried to focus a lot more than Hermes does on human hands in this video and their interaction with the um, competitor. So these were very simple machines, but um, a lot of the shots were like from behind, so you could see like my arms and the pressure um, we were putting onto the actual machine. So it was kind of Trying to be this balance. I think if I did a few more revisions, it would have been a little more. Yeah, yeah, so we got a little comments. So. All right, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, of course. I mean, I think the human thing is just pretty, you know, it's not like, you know, you put a monkey on it. Right. Like, well, it's not human made. But, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> like I, think, I think the thing that is still missing is that it's, it has no personality. Like, it has no personality. You know, it's still like human made is an easy concept to get across. But, like you put yourself into making this product, and that that character is now embodied in these tools, which is an important part of you know this craft world. And like without that, it's it's just a kind of like lower budget version of, of the way Apple does. So you're kind of saying there shouldn't be a there should be a fix. Uh, it's just yeah, I think. Okay. Yeah. Well, sorry. I was going to say more. Just listen. Just, just looking at, I oh, was just listening to people what they're saying. I think that your where you kind of put together design, making, and branding, you sort of put them all on top of each other. I think that you need to be, that's where you need to be really clear about that. Because I think that that's what you're saying. We're, we're saying that, I think you could go as far as to say that in lean manufacturing or in the, that system, the d design has to go into that system. And they have to, because we're, we're not satisfied anymore with faceless manufacturing because we know it can be really bad. We want to know about it. So I think you're saying designers need to get involved in that. And marketing people as well. It's not good enough to leave it to engineers because they don't care about all that stuff. Yeah, I think you could build on Andy's comment, you know, if you move from mass manufacturing to into a I think counter that a little bit. Like lean manufacturing built in Engineers, design engineers, and everyone has different things. Whereas new manufacturing has all these people on the same team on the floor, right. and then they have a task each day to tackle as a team. Mm -hmm. And you know, they all stretch in the morning and have tackle boards for them to do those kind of repetitive task motions. Right. It's a group of people doing it, and that group of people tackle it as a team with designers and other teams. And over time, the product iterates on the ground and not you know, as a as a silo. Into it, one of the reasons to do that is potentially to have like variation in it. 
Otherwise, that's just making the change. Right. So maybe that job is going to continue. Do they have the people job enough to be, um, you know, are they just trying to do a scene to do the acting pieces to line up the, the legs on their packaging and the humor that's operating that thing as well. And it's a very, very sensitive shot. And so what's an interesting thing is actually, like, how can we um, make use of that polish, that, that interesting um, creativity that comes from only a human being in the process? But then also uh, adding on to that as well, so the machines are taking over more of these jobs, how can we allow these machines to have these interesting creative languages as well? As we're thinking about, you know, additive manufacturing and stuff like that, how can we allow these machines to speak in their own language and create these new stories? Chris? I just have one observation. I don't know what it is, but I, I noticed how much this black circle looked like vinyl record yeah. and on the record player. And so I see that layer of reintroducing a throwback to a previous technology and process that had nothing to do with the law, but it's an interesting re, you know, revisiting and readaptation. And I don't know where that fits in the design. Um, I, no, I really no. wanted to be but it might be used in the future to do, to bring back other forms that have some echo with them that add interest for that reason. Thank you. <laughs>
that I mentioned that journal writing and recording their thoughts have taught them uh, a lot in their life and kind of was a growing experience for them and a learning experience as well. And it also uh, helped them to deal with their stress and frustration in life. So um, the box is in two sections, as you can see here. And in one section, you record your feelings, your tangible stuff that you want to collect. And in the other one, you record your thoughts. So journals or little pieces of paper that you want to keep and your inspiration, maybe. And um, this side represents your mind. Uh, this side represents your um, feelings which is circular and you can kind of touch the box even to feel and the other side represents your mind and they're kind of like Lego pieces that you can put together to connect them together and separate them to be co-host. And when you put them together, your mind and body and the box has these different layers to make it more fun and kind of like a Russian doll experience in which you reveal more intimate stuff as you go. And this sort of creates an organization that is flexible and exciting to open. And the smallest box is actually a tiny time capsule that you can remove and And it's kind of shaped like a mailbox because you can put in your little notes and your letters to the future and, and keep them in this little time capsule. And when the time comes, you can open it up to see what you've written before. And over time, these will accumulate into the little books. And I have some samples here. These will come with the box and you can rip off pages and you can take a look. And the time capsule has this little key that you can use to open it when the time comes and it's uh, another exciting element to it. So why was I designing this box? The purpose of the actually introspective observation. Rudolf Steiner, who is a philosopher, said that in order to understand who we are as a person and become free, we're supposed to understand our actions and motivations first. And this experience of expressing your thoughts and then reflecting back on them actually helps you to be more mindful as a person. And essentially, mindfulness and meditation is understanding your thoughts and your feelings. It is a focused relaxation of self-awareness. And the box kind of encourages this behavior. And it is a mindful box. <laughs> Follow your memories <laughs> and uh, inspirations and sometimes frustrations as well, so that you can go back to them. So the project originally started out with stress and anxiety. And in this culture of speed that we live in, it is a growing problem. And that's how I arrived at meditation and mindfulness. And awareness of your thoughts and feelings and taking better care of your mind actually helps you as a person to become stress-free and being in tune with your mind and body as a person makes you happier as well. And express, expressing and reflecting of uh, your thoughts and feelings actually um, is the process that I use to 
uh, reach my opponent. And through my validation and my interviews, I learned that therapy awareness and relief comes through this experience of recording thoughts and reflecting. And that's how I arrived at my final concept of the box. And if uh, kids use these boxes over time to accumulate their thoughts, they'll become hopefully mindful adults as well. And this is a way of encouraging them to take better care of their mind and become less stress-free as a person. So it is a journey of getting to know yourself and see your improvement and be more confident as a person. that they were intimidated by large paper, also they were intimidated by writing, and they thought writing was a kind of boring exercise, but it's actually very helpful, so I wanted to encourage that behavior, and through these little boxes, you can actually um, jot down thoughts faster, and it, it's in a way less um, intimidating for people. So this is because I know you, you thought about this a little bit, like the digital world that we live in and how some of that could be integrated into this. So can you talk a little bit about some of the ideas you have for that? Yeah, of course. I was actually originally thinking creating a hard drive, because a hard drive is a box as well. And um, through the feedback that I got, I kind of, I kind of went into the more physical feeling type of um, design, but I was originally considering to create a design where it was almost an app with a hard drive, essentially. And, and yeah, I think I'm happier with the result. I have a question. As a keeper of journals for many years, less and less so, I find that most of my writing takes place when I'm in a down spot. Mm -hmm. I'm analyzing. I don't usually, when I'm feeling happy and optimistic and productive, I don't take mm -hmm. the time to write about it. Yeah. So the record can be simply um, half of a record of your feel, and we can forget that we actually mm -hmm. felt optimistic and, and positive and, and energetic. Had you considered any ways to sort of incorporate and encourage that aspect of the feelings too? Yes, I was actually focusing on suppressing an anxiety. So I was actually dealing with frustrations. And a lot of people said that they use it to get their frustrations out, writing. So generally, I was just focusing on people, getting people to write in a way and mm -hmm. making it a playful experience. But at the same time, um, the time capsule kind of makes you go back and look back at stuff. And that aspect is actually for you to be able to look objectively and judge objectively of how you were feeling. Because most of the time, if you're feeling stressed, and you look back, you kind of laugh at it, and you're like, ah, oh, why was I feeling this way? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Question? Yeah, um, reflection. That's what I was thinking about with um, Franco's box. He actually had it in a closet and I made him kind of like take out the, this old card box. And I was thinking that the, if the design of it is actually very simple and you can just set it on the table or in somewhere, somewhere in your room, it will be almost like a visual reminder that you see. But of course, um, the playful element can play into kind of the time capsule element can play into reflecting back, but at the same time, you kind of
kind of define your own reflection and the time to look back at them.
maybe bring that back again for next time it visits. You know, whether it's a photo documentation, I don't know if it's a tripod review, but um, <laughs> it, 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 it would really help us understand the depth um, to many, actually, with this project. Because it's hard to follow. Yeah, I agree with that. I think there's a little bit of tension between you not wanting to limit the user, but then getting lost in the area. So there's a lot going on in this area that you started to There are a lot of decisions that need to be made in that. So especially if you're limiting the space that the user can have for that. How are you going to limit the form of the material? Like if you have something recorded for some kind of cue for how I'll raise the space. Like I also like connect them up with different levels. Like how do I know which level is most important? Like can you know form be the best thing or is there some other layer on top of it like matching the information that's going to have you using help them to He opened himself up to the intimate lady and he kind of left them hanging. Um, and the second piece is, and I am very uncomfortable with generalizations. So if you're going to talk about the value uh, journaling has for stress and stress okay. reduction, um, you need to show me where you got that information. Okay. Because you made some really sweeping generalizations and some of those are true. But you have to be very specific about, you know, the American Psychological Association says that, that or you can't make those generalizations. I can't say that this particular tool is going to get so be really cautious about that because you did that and I sort of stopped paying attention because you had already said to me this will fix this without telling me what the real this was to me and what the real I just think that <clears throat> there's a lot of applications where this could be applied to uh, mindfulness and healing process. John Cabot then started the whole thing up at uh, Boston Medical Center for people who are recovering from heart surgery, stroke, whatever it is, and plus the alcohol. I mean, there are people where cultivation of mindfulness is a, is a health issue and a healing process or self-learning. And I think that could be applied more, it has possibilities to be applied more directly there. Okay, thank you.
Job at somebody, like really make a real honest effort to make someone feel really bad. Yeah. It makes you feel a lot better. I just jab. I yeah. did a big jab this time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank <laughs> you. 
This is not the time. A recent documentary named Under the Dome has stated that for China to reach the 25 micrograms per meter through standard, it will take more than 15 to 20 years. And due to difficulties in regulating policies relating to um, industrial pollution, the rise in car ownership, the use, usage of poor quality on large coal and lower income households, and also not enough green areas in urban cities. So um, uh, it has been strongly recommended that people wear smog masks when they go out and, and to um, prevent from breathing in smog. So, how does this all relate to fashion? Can you explain that what these um, skirts and warning people in China would, right, would, um, would want to would want to um, wear masks? However, that is not the case. And what I try to understand through surveys and research is like what is the Um, so for the, I have found four main reasons that contribute to this number. The first is laziness, or do not, or do not care enough. This is mostly represented by um, male, below 25, and above 25. 
second group is just not informed and they're not willing to purchase these masks. Um, these are represented by low and middle or lower income families, and so this is almost 50.2% of the population that the government has endorsed. The third group is more conservative style, and here the sample of masks currently in the Chinese market. These people think um, the form is not attractive or comfortable, and they're concerned for the personal image. And they are represented by urban dwelling, low educated, and also fashion conscious people. The fourth um, is as a general public, where cultural acceptance is one that like applies to all, and mass has been associated with danger, distance, and impoliteness, as well as very few reasons fear ever since the outbreak of SARS in 2014. So the conference challenge is how to um, get more people on board to wear a mask willingly. And the first two groups particularly difficult to solve because when they're not <coughs> they're either not interested in protecting themselves or they do not have the ability to even though we need it the most. And while the second two are directly related and have a close <coughs> So the strategy I've decided to implement is to let fashion take the country. It can, um, if I can solve the problem for the group of users who specifically chose to not wear a mask because of their earlier design, and produce a collection of masks that are fashion <coughs> and desirable potentially lead to a change in people's perception of uh, soft um, mass and indirectly solve for cultural acceptance. Also with a higher end design language and branding effort. Um, uh, the price premium, the, the large market need as well as price premium to generate enough profit to have a decent portion donated to low income communities and supply them with basic bring another group of users on board. So this project became more of a design challenge, and to better understand this challenge, I studied traditional accessories to understand form language and to as well as style, as well as functional medical devices and wearable technology. And this led me to um, produce a conceptual collection um, named GEM. The GEM is a collection of masks that seek to challenge traditional on the market today, and the, the concept collection consists of three faceted clear masks, which is inspired by gem cups. Each mask has two stackable filters placed along the side uh, to contain two fiber web filter pads to shut them in two days. And the mask has a silicon molded edge attached to fit to each individual space, and in between both side panels and bands that vary in design and material. This particular collection has been inspired by patterns in nature, which animals and Organisms have adopted to help them survive in their reality, and three of the designs are taken to prototyping phase. So the mask fits comfortably around the head and can be worn also around the neck when one's in use. We carry it in the complementary mask case. The filter cases on the sides minimize obstruction of facial features, which users are most concerned about, and also allow for minimal contact with skin, unlike traditional fabric masks, directly tied around the face. And by reimagining what started as a medical wearable device um, and into a fashion accessory, the mask could be more integrated into one's daily outfit, which allows it to be featured on magazines, runways, and other advertisements. Um, so while these sets of masks will be priced tag as contemporary high end range, the form allows the design to move both up and down the fashion tier, appealing to consumers from the high luxury sector such as vegetarian leather and precious materials, uh, metals, and down to fashion, fast fashion consumers with trendy fashion jewelry and fabric. So going back to the side rounds, the desired outcome is that these groups of users will be able to push forward the idea of wearing a mask as it resonates with their own personal style. A further group fashion challenging society and government to pay more attention to the problem, to support and bring awareness to the groups and users that have been left on the sidelines for a long time. Although the goal of the project is to try and have more people protect themselves against scars, the real hope is that China can have its blue sky back and have no need for a mask because after all, scars are not something to be celebrated. And some may think that um, making a mask fashionable is a little controversial. Um, but as a designer who is trying to like extremely fine line between design and ethics, it's important to go into the issue with like, a very clear and right mindset to use fashion only as a design tool and to the project in the end was not only a design challenge for myself, it was also a social experiment to gauge people's response.
going to the rest of your research year. And in the end, I hope that it can be part of a movement to raise awareness as well as inspire the climate. And I love the concept of the, the social good impact of it. The only thing I would say is show where that actually is a business that works. So if you just throw up with some names like Warby Parker, right? These glasses, I buy them, somebody else gets it there. Tom's shoes, that there are business models that are work that are successful. Just to show, because at first when you show that first image and you left the low income folks out and grab it's like, oh my God. And then when you saved it by saying, we can make this work, I would show where the people don't know about those companies that are super successful and are generating income but are also supporting others. Um, I think that even elevates it to the, to the next level. These are, this is really fascinating. Any questions? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Have you given consideration to the development of masks for ch babies and children? Um, I think that would be the next step. Yeah, because they're going to need 20 years to reduce emissions before these kids grow up. Yeah. They're going to, it's going to take a while, and you want to incentivize them to reduce emissions. emissions. But I think mothers particularly would be very interested in protecting their babies in a charming way, you know. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the uh, Jewish So wearing a mask um, is possibly have some, some definite social interaction. So for example, talking to each other, not being able to see um, masks um, and the, the things that you know, eating and drinking you know, there is a barrier to a very sort of important um, sort of connection between using conversation um, and just you know, engaging with each other. Um, I sort of I, I don't know about it. for the here and now and technology right now sort of lags in like performing a non like verbal technology is not on track for it. And that's why I try to make it a really easy healthy online possible so you wouldn't need to take off your mask and then leave it on your neck and it'll be like a safe and effective piece in a way. Um, there are uh, nose masks that cover just the nose and then you can speak but no matter what like, I tried like a lot of designs for that and asked people how they felt about it. It's really important, the, the mouth and nose part, the, the thing whole hinges on that. And I think of the problems in France, for instance, with wearing uh, scarves. It's more that people are afraid of people they can't see. And you want to, your whole person is in your face. 
And I think that's really critically important to allow that. And it looks very credible. Um, I like the fact that you have sort of a beard looking thing for guys. And <laughs> earring looking. I mean, I think it works and it would make it very easy to buy one of those in Target. You know, or especially with the cultural Avengers and superheroes. Good Lord. Who wouldn't want to be a superhero? <coughs> Me, but, you know. A beard is <laughs> Here's your investor present. You just send the address to Ann. <laughs> I would just say if you could have, I don't know how the Tuesday situation works, but if you could actually have a lot of people that you have here, to me it's even a stronger impact to see them the, the way you're presenting them there, but to see them this way, it elevates the intelligence of them almost twofold, just by putting them on camera. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting, if you introduce this to this generation of teens and 20-somethings, um, and you know the, the tipping point might give you some ideas about who are the people who spread ideas. Um, but this group will influence younger people to want to be cool. And it can also influence older generations to think if they're wearing it, I don't look stupid either. You know? I think this is a key to your success of who models it first. And if it's really considered pretty cool, uh, especially in terms of health, too. I mean, I just think there's a style function here, but it's not going to get better before it gets, you know, it's going to get worse before it gets better, I think. So making this a popular and acceptable thing is a really profound and worthy goal. Money to, to some security that you do not get in here, but it's an interesting thing to possibly think about. Um, and citizen science about um, population, about pollution is a big 
having a very big important thing that can be um, very simple um, uh, like little test um, uh, not um, yeah tests to um, for you know just general members of the population to um, you know, monitor you know the, the smog in my area or where I live and stuff like that. So you can if you start thinking of this as a platform to possibly enable you know um, personal um, monitoring of the pop of the um, pollution where I've been because you could you know link that with an app on your smartphone. Your GPS knows where you've been all the time. You know this could be a platform for actually collecting lots of really important data to actually end up solving the problems of dealing with of this pollution in the first place. Um, I'm
to kind of be a marketing platform or a way to represent ourselves to not just the objects, but how to create the overall content of the audience to even look at stuff. So this is um, going to be the most of the video that I will want to do. This is a concept piece. Um, all these visuals and maps are represented as if they're the concepts of my brand rather than the individual objects themselves. And so within my collection of items you saw earlier, uh, some of them are functional for sale and some of them are just meant for concept to kind of create this world. And so um, that is just the last example of the campaign right here. Not like meant primarily for this campaign purposes. And then um, um, this is just like a few images of that um, And so this is also just it's meant to exhibit like personality in a way. How am I representing myself as a designer, but also how to And one thing I am also selling are these pins, and you can kind of know where they are now. But I wanted to take the pin concept, and a lot of um, the background design piece that I just showed, and these with the white background, my whole concept of these pieces were inspired by these boards. And so this idea of this board is a way of how <coughs> same way brands kind of bring back this whole marketplace to an audience. How My concern, so let me clear this. My concern is that they are established brands who are now branding themselves in the UA, and you're not an established brand and are going that route. Right. So they already had an identity, and I'm worried that your identity is driving their product, and your product is not driving their identity. Yeah, I can see what you mean, but I guess I wanted to focus on like just how, like, the craftsmanship of the bag is that is that, like, that is something that. Uh, judge, you know, once a year and pick it up. But also, it, there's so much design in the world here. There's so many backpacks and so many, like, keychains and so many accessories in the world that I feel like recent, like now, with the digital platform and everything, you need 
something extra. You can't just sell a green knife in your back pocket. You can outsource something and have a product. And that's not so difficult anymore. It's more about how do I explain or just represent myself as a designer aesthetically that like what we're saying, you know, it's really a lot of like aesthetics, not just about the product, but about like the whole package. And so what I want to work on is just if I were an established brand, knowing how much effort people put into marketing. I mean, I think kind of similar to what I said, it's like kind of true. Most of these brands started with a story. They had like these mm -hmm. core products that are, are very high quality, and then they use branding as an opportunity to kind of like pull out that story and show that you can make really you said some of these are actually just prototypes, they're not actually functional bags. Oh no, these, these are, are all these are all this I mean those are these are functional. Uh, but I also but I focus on like the conceptual pieces for like visual content. So that purpose. So they're both functional and non functional on the but I'm selling the functional ones. You're selling like the ideas. Yeah, it's more of just like the ideas. Idea. So it's kind of a backwards way of branding. Okay. It is. It's kind of a backwards way, but there's, I wanted to see if, you know, the validation would happen once I go to the show, which is on the like, to come out here sooner. Okay. But using strategies that are so successful for the brands that are so well known, how can they um, invest in really, like, instead of, you know, focusing so much on like, the quality of product and making that the same, but also making it the world you want to market and people you can find. Do you yeah. consider telling the story behind that as well? Mm -hmm. Like the story, you kind of came upon that a little bit, but I didn't mm -hmm. see that in the actual brand story. Um, and like the, the brand? Or yeah. Like, yeah, well, my idea was, I mean, I don't know if that was more meant to be for the company, but the whole idea of these objects was, it was, was the blue of the white was Which for me is kind of telling you the idea of how brand offers to spend the whole marketplace. And um, same texture is used on all these packs that you see here on the thing. And so there is an aesthetic consistency with it. And then the pink with the mask, I wanted to show, you know, this same concept of having the sparks on the eye and have it all over the face with the armor. Or, you know. um, I want to jump That's not your intention. Um, well, it's, but it can be. I think we sometimes get, I, I think we sometimes think that the way we have to justify and develop our ideas is going to be immediately digestible by our audience. Like, you're going through this, this, this deep kind of way in which you're approaching your work and think that can directly be translated into accepting of an audience. And, like, the way that those other brands are doing it, they're humanizing it a bit, they're making it, they're putting it in a context where people can relate, like, the, 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 uh, the tweets on, you know, instead it's ice cream. Like, there are things that people can kind of connect to. And although I think some of the way in which you're adding character to your objects is nice, it's a, it's a little, I, I don't see how to connect to it. Because they're so isolated in this world that doesn't, that I can't relate to. Like, 
Well, I just don't think, I mean, we haven't painted any picture of how, of the context in which these objects reside in. And there's well, no reference like to the, the objects um, themselves. It's kind of how I would imagine these things. Uh, well, that first one was, the most, really was the most, like, kind of revealing one. The one just on the white background. And then it just got dark. Um, you know, and then it was just like weird dances in the dark. And I, I just, I lost, we lost. So the like, way I understand when you see a place is like when you look at the sky. It's not necessarily for like the TV campaign, it's more like an installation for me to kind of surround what I want to view. And I was talking to um, Irving Williams who's then who is the um, the campaign for he does campaign for the rest of and a lot of these families and I showed him all my stuff. And I didn't even tell him what they were meant for, but he's like, okay. Because you showed only the vignettes and not the display, I just disconnected from your original content. Uh, yeah, yeah, I did a lot of things. I have a model from the past, but I have a very beautiful photo. I don't think you're interested in that. Yeah, I'm not going to be interested in that. Could be like what are some of the, what are the things that your brain is trying to get across? Like, how do you communicate that? Can you use words? And then you can keep talking about it. Is there stuff in that? I think that when you, you, you find that edge of when does this discomfort become stylish and interesting and edgy, and when does it become scary? Yeah. But, uh, you know, I think the idea of score is a good idea, because they're both positive scores and negative scores. But I think it can be stressed more that this is a sort of a radiating radio and kind of design process that it produces itself, it's sort of self-generating by cell division or something. Eddie? Are you going to put it together for Tuesday? Yeah, I think it's a yes or no. Yes, just say yes. Just say yes. Greg's don't see it.
This is a projection mapping. So I decided that screens encompass all of those things or informative vessels being an object that has information on it. So well, the reason why I chose that because it seemed like a good way to be incredibly theoretical and abstract with the way that I progressed through the semester, which is great because I have a lot of ideas that are completely unachievable by me. So that was a way for me to frame it so that I could do all of the things. So what you want to expect for this presentation is that I'm gonna have an idea then I'm going to have an abstraction of that idea of what it is in society. Then I'm going to do something about it. And then I'm going to outline some possibilities and hopefully inspire people to do something in the future. And just to like give you an example of this, uh, this is a freelance job I've been doing called Solar Wave. It's a uh, solar panel speaker. I think the name. I bring this up because I was really proud because the guy wanted to put a, a little LCD screen on it to show how much battery power was on it. I was like, no, we should just put a light meter here because you don't need a screen on everything. So this semester has like sometimes been like um, a way for me to tell people that I have jobs that I know more than you about screens and then like take keep screens out of certain situations where they shouldn't be. For instance, this. My second one is setting as influence. So like instead of an iPhone being everywhere, maybe if it's in less places, it can have again more. Maybe this can tell you an idea about how bamboo grows, or maybe it can tell you something about topics. So this is now a, a spiral that I put in the new point mark. And yet, hopefully, like, the fact that some of the bigger ones are towards the east and smaller ones are towards the west, I don't know which one is which, uh, you will get a better picture of time and, like, shape based off that. So, yeah, so I explored a lot of things during the semester. I'm going to explore more green things uh, and hopefully make more students. Thank you very much. of pixels that work together to make up a message. And in some cases, that's pretty, that's like obvious, but in some cases, it's not. Like, uh, I'm trying to think of what ones like didn't obviously have pixels. Yeah, like this is less of, like, okay, each panel is a pixel in this case. Cell phone, and I really would have liked you to dig in a little bit more about that because I thought you were leading us down the road that screens could be used as a, as a way to create more human interaction mm -hmm. with humans. Yeah. And you veered off that. And, mm -hmm. and I was, to be honest, was disappointed because yeah. I was hoping you would take that road and figure out how do these screens now create more human interaction. So there yeah. seemed to at least be a little bit of tension. Is, is that accurate? I would say yes, but I didn't want to go into that too much because I do love the iPhone. I love screens. I mean, like, I think it's a great thing. But like an example of what I would consider progress in that context is the Kindle versus the, the, the iPhone. Because I don't read on my iPhone because it hurts your eyes. So the Kindle is a uh, thing that has less function that you hopefully buy that offers you more, a more humanistic experience. Yeah. We're experiencing this now on projection on the screen with your voice. Um, you've got four colors that we're perceiving. How a working off of pre-existing uh, technology that's out there and kind of how you could augment that or build off of that to create Just build off this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just you might, I, I don't know if you explored voxel, but other ways of thinking about pixels and conceptualizing that, maybe in a lot of schools, they're three dimensional pixels. So, um, other ways of kind of using the metaphor of a pixel and taking it somewhere else. Okay. I don't think screens would be an answer for you. Uh, I think your work is really interesting and we've been touching on it for so Why hang on screens? Like, all the things that use them back then. That, um, a lot of these uh, things 
that we experience and have in our lives are like the tears from the streets. Shout out to the streets. Um, <laughs> and there are so many um, great things about streams and so many um, you know, interesting about streams as well. Um, so along with that, the internet has connected us um, around 5 billion people as well as 10 billion things uh, as of now. And in about five years, it's going to be 50 billion percent of the internet, which means so many major uh, games and TV and uh, just like a whole new field of uh, what's going to happen in the internet. But as the third point, it's a way, it's basically like a natural way to create all of the applications uh, so that they can share data and understand each other. Secondly, there are spectacular sensors in the sides where uh, you know, this, this thing can map out the space and understand. So I would say a collective experience between individuals. Um, one of the most important insights I found out and I discovered through research and testing this semester was that a lot of the times music is not about the music itself, but about the memories and the stories and how people personally identify with it in terms of how they see themselves within a community and how they see themselves. Um, and traditionally, a lot of that, a big portion of that is how we associate ourselves with physical objects, um, like records and CDs that as a collection would become almost like our fingerprint, like our music fingerprint, how we identify ourselves, and how we could share and experience that with others. Um, but within this kind of streaming context now that we have with streaming services, um, one of the big questions comes up, is, or like the comment, is that when you have a million songs in your pocket, it's hard to give a shit about any of them. And uh, quantitatively, that's true. Um, Spotify's um, data shows that half of all users, or half of every song played, is skipped before it comes to the end. And 25% of those songs skipped actually happen within the first five minutes. So, or five seconds, sorry, five seconds. <laughs> Long song. Um, and so it's true that it's sort of creating this sort of passive listening experience. Um, now, this quote comes from Matt Fiedler, who is the co-founder of a company called Vinyl Me Please. It's a 
record company that for 23 bucks a month you can uh, <coughs> you can you will get a uh, record a month um, plus an art print plus a cocktail recipe to make <laughs> while you listen to that record and you also get a bunch of access to their weekly um, blog posts and everything and it's a startup and in, in just three years they've gone from 10 customers to 13,000 and they're now making revenues of over 3.5 million um, and they've really hit this kind of positioning market segment of people who are really looking forward in um, kind of trends in music, um, but also really enjoy this kind of way that they identify with the music. Um, so it really brought me to a place where I wanted to see how I could enhance that sociability of music, um, enable a conversation around music, and considering that music now is an experience, it's physical and digital, how can you make that really easy? Um, so I've been trying to look towards this a uh, place between kind of a personal reflective experience of streaming music by yourself and um, these lives, live music venues that are more social. Something that's uh, what I've been calling collective streaming, where it's more of a decentralized music control. Um, so this is the concept I came up with. Um, it's essentially a Bluetooth speaker that, rather than a one-to-one -one, uh, like Bluetooth pairing between an iPhone and a speaker, uh, many iPhones connect to this one speaker in order to form a uh, play key. Um, and it'd be a digital, physical uh, interaction and experience. Um, on your phone, if you're connected or with, within range of this uh, speaker, you can simply, if you're just on any streaming surface, just add it to your queue. And rather than playing from your phone, it would just be added to the queue on the speaker. Um, and that'd be a one level of interaction. Um, to go deeper, you could uh, download an app which you could actually see the cue of what songs are playing, um, focusing a lot on the artworks and kind of the message that these artists are bringing. Um, and you can even add um, kind of the, you know, if you like the song, you can add it. Um, if you don't like it, you can put, press skip. And if enough people in the, air, in the room press skip, um, it won't be played. Um, and in a way that, you know, if you don't know that song, you know, you could possibly show where, um, who put that on the and you can ask that person, hey, like, who is this? Why do you like this music? What sort of genre is it? Um, and even in a, in a less um, intense kind of interaction, you can just have a push notification that kind of does the same function. Um, as a product, I wanted to show it as a poetic statement of those old interactions with physical, with physical things, so um, in fine form of a record player. Um, and you can have this screen which can show the cue also that you can scroll up and down. Um, and when you clicked on one of the album covers, you can see more about that artist and uh, you can create a conversation. You can be at that speaker um, with someone else and kind of go through like, oh, I really like this person. Oh, I really like that person too. This is why we get all this stuff that we do. Um, so the speaker would be there and it can come in many different colorways um, depending on how risky you like your or to a more poppy um, presentation for a product. Um, and so basically what I want to uh, come across in this presentation is to show that there is this unbelievable opportunity to really get people to actively pay attention to their music um, and to really create a conversation about it. Because <clears throat> right now, as streaming stands, like for me personally, the majority of my interactions with other people with music is with my coworkers who basically are just zone, you know, they're passive things. It's all white noise. They're not really paying attention to the music that they're listening to. And I think that it's really important to know um, what your friends like to listen to. Um, it's, a, it's a huge part of everyone's lives. And um, I think it'll create a much better experience. An experience that is worth There's a jukebox set up in a lot of bars, touch home, touch tunes, right? Where you can do the same sort of yeah. process, right? So mm -hmm. this is clearly a house party type situation where you're playing. So there's an application like, or you look how they use that technology and how you can simply apply it to this thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to more um, resonate with the 
people of a younger de demographic is usually the people that like buy from these venues try to market towards people in like the 20 to 30 year old range. Um, emphasizing but yeah, emphasizing the portability, you know, you can bring it anywhere and, and have that conversation there. It doesn't have to be in the home, it can be, you know, out in the park, it can be anywhere that people have asked. Yeah, I think that's why the problem with the technology and prices and stuff. Like, do you think of that? Um, the technology, yeah, TouchTune basically does the same thing. Um, it's a lot more, like, app based like, you do pair it with an app, and it is. There's a lot of companies that are doing um, something very similar to this right now. Um, it's kind of like a race right now to do it. Um, and I'll just kind of do one that's touch between um, Bose. You know, there's a lot of companies that are like trying to get to this level of experience right now. Yeah, how would you think about this? Um, mine, I wanted to specifically like do the design show kind of those people who are really into records also. We're in like a really interesting point in music where we are like there's so many people, almost everyone is streaming. Almost everyone my age, um, but at the same time, record sales are the highest they've been in 25 years, which just seems like almost counterintuitive. And yet, somehow, there's people that are overlapping within those two things. Did you talk to any people that you're identifying with right now? Yeah, I, I did a lot of uh, testing. I would like bring kind of physical. Uh, yeah, so I did a lot of testing with people my age. Um, I would just like, I asked them what their favorite uh, artists were, I put them on cards, and I gave them to them at a, just a small gathering of people, and we just all talked about our um, favorite artists, why we like them, it great, created a great conversation, like hearing that like my friend Peter Borges loves listening to Slayer when he's moderating the metal shop. That's really interesting, to me. you know, I never knew that. And so, um, or like, you know, Ryan Murphy's favorite artist is Taylor Swift. And so things that are really interesting, like those like little tiny, they can be quirks, sometimes they're like really, really obvious, sometimes they're really not. And it's really great to know those sides of people's personalities, especially because so many people are listening to music all the time now because it's so streamlined with their phones and their lives. Hearing someone like look at an Amy Winehouse uh, album and go, I remember exactly the thing I was wearing while I would while she like while I found out that she died. Mm -hmm. Things like that, and it created a really interesting conversation that like even I took part of, and I didn't even know that. <laughs> like it was like really cool. Last question. We're gonna come into like ten minutes. Yeah. 
So I really focused on um, this kind of tangible, like with the product thing. Right, because, the, yeah, because they're and, and the display on the product itself is supposed to kind of replicate that CD rack or that record rack. Um, there are several apps that actually do what um, um, that do this. Like Party Cube is one of them. Um, Spotify closed their app finder thing, so basically it was gone. They tried to do a Kickstarter and it failed. Um, it's just like when it's just with an app, it really doesn't work. Um, just as a business model, it doesn't work. Whereas there's companies like Sonos that are doing these app speaker integrations that are really, really, really good and people are buying them and they're really successful because they can create that service while also showing that tangible product as well. So that sometimes it like encapsulates what And also, so I think I kind of, I think it's very important to actually be able to sort of be open and honest about the songs as well, because you may have quite a bad taste in music, but we, we take the music we like to and, and also, it's like, you know, it's, that we all have those guilty pleasures. And it's amazing when you're like walking down the supermarket and it's really like cheesy, like some club bizarre, and like everyone is like bopping their head. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's, I think that like, you know, kind of embracing that either through anonymity or creating a culture around being like, hey, it's music, we love it, it's great, and that, that's kind of an interesting social culture that we could possibly develop. Mm -hmm. so Melissa, Will, and uh, Nick, and yeah. all of these examples that you're talking about, I'm like, yeah, I'm actually happening in music and not science. We were talking about going through the record store and looking at these things, and you just showed us that. I don't even know that one, but these are all things that aren't actively happening while the music is playing. So my challenge to you would be, how can you, it's about those interactions, it's about how can you make this more than play my song when I first skip? So if that's what everyone else has in the space, and that's what you're saying, we're not really playing game design, so how can we have an enemy, how can we make it so that we're not embarrassed to play each other, so who knows what they're doing? Um, <laughs> 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 I was really excited at the beginning, you know, with like the quotes were great and the graphics were great, and it was really just tied into like all our childhood. But this seems to just be like a ton of iteration of what Spotify already is here. And you talked a little bit about the tactiles, and you know, I kind of wanted you to bring that back. Like, you know, we could have gone so many different directions, like a mailing service where instead of sending you a vinyl, they send you like a USB with a great mix of songs on that. Uh, you had that card for the new medium for which you play physical tunes over the record. Or you could be at a party and what was the status of that party? That created new emotion and you might have kissed a girl when you liked at that party <laughs> and that playlist will end up in your house the next day in a solid object and now you have new emotion with a solid object. Uh, and you could have gone, I think, a lot further with this. Uh, and I think you should go off further with this because it's definitely something where everyone is Um, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of this is this is this is that uh, you know I think you probably get to a point where you're like oh crap I have to like put this in a form where I can present something or we make the occasion to do some part like this but you, you kind of just you, you, you're in a good starting place again for like now how can I really take all these things that are out there like Sonos and what they're doing and really just push it further and go farther because it doesn't it isn't just an object. That whole experience, it's the analog experience, it's the digital experience, it's gamification. And you could, you know, I'd be interested to see what the next, what the next kind of evolution of this idea is for sure. This is an entirely convenient thing that I like to say. Um, so I, I think it's, you know, it's a couple of, and we started off with this really great um, concept of creating memory and communication and research process of music, and we really filtered all of that out. 
you still have um, opportunities to bring those those concepts that you presented in the beginning back into this, just because you have a screen. So how about playing out the image aspect of the sensory experience, about the video? Um, maybe have um, even just user submitted content that you put out in here. And I am saying um, right on your list. That's the end of the line. <laughs> I also started about, off saying it wasn't about the music. Yeah, but it, 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 it is because you know it is about the music at the end of the day because it's that it's the, music is the tool that invokes the emotion that you're trying to get to and then you get people to talk about it. So I would say if you're going to do this again, there should be some sort of music. I don't care if anybody likes it or not, but it will. It will you know, I would say people are just in a car. If if you play "Don't Stop Believing My Journey," ninety-eight percent of the people in this room know this song. Whether or not they like it, they want to dance. It's, it's, but I would use music because I think it does lead people to what you're trying to get them to do. It is about a share of like what our story is about. Thanks. You have one minute for your presentation. That's still one minute. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, thank you. <laughs> 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 but as I mentioned before, uh, he's having surgery today, so he cannot present. Uh, so now, why don't we take a maybe five minute break? Oh. It's a little scratch. And then, uh, please come back in five minutes. Uh, we're going to start with Ryan Murphy. <laughs> I mean, some of these like higher level concepts, like it just doesn't seem 
like there's any type of teacher who would give you feedback. Like, 
that facilitators do.
this proved to be a sort of very valuable um, thing that people responded to after these first initial prototypes. And so I went back, made some more legitimate versions, which I can pass around to how uh, that came to be, and then actually went and hung up in the subway. And you can imagine this is not exactly legal, so I would find these like 15 second periods where no one was there and like scurry down, and then it's like really dirty because it's just there, like wipe off and then like pack something up. And to the point where, you know, 60,000 people per day are seeing this. And so it got picked up by a lot of different sort of blogs and magazines thinking about the fact that, hey, this is actually... Uh, so Thrillist picked it up, uh, Matchville did a whole piece on it, Fast Company picked it up as well, which is really exciting. But I think the best article was written by uh, DNA Info, because they both sent their own photographer, which I was kind of flattered by. And they talked to actual people, and they specifically talked to the MTA, which is something I've had a lot of trouble doing this semester. And they got their official spokesperson to comment on this issue. And I think this highlights what my whole thesis is about and why it's such an issue, is because the MTA doesn't see it as an issue. And yet we walk, we move, we commute every single day through the subway from people in New York who are tourists, and we find that it is an issue. So I think there's a huge potential, and even in these sort of low impact, but sort of earth, high impact, low cost ways like the sterile signs of addressing this need. Because at the end of the day, like, this is what you see. But so providing that sort of simple information does one thing in terms of sort of orienting you, but you're also still traveling through this pretty ugly, kind of dreary, like you hate these sounds. And I think there's a lot of ways from a design perspective that we can really sort of make this, uh, these stations more beautiful and more representative of what, um, where we actually want to go and what neighborhood um, so I had a meeting with people from the Department of Transportation, who um, one of the lead people there uh, started the MTA's Arts for Transit project. Um, and pulling from a different design icon, this time Saul Steinberg, and his classic um, New York aesthetic of um, sort of very simple drawings. But, and I went through about, let's say, like about 3,200 of the sketches in the six different books and things online. And what you see is a lot of these images. It's things that you kind of come to associate with white New York middle-aged businessmen, right? And when there's very little gender equality, most women are either secretaries or moms. And from a racial perspective, you have just across the board pretty obscene things. So a big part of this project has been thinking about, can we pull from this very rich New York aesthetic in a way that kind of modernizes it into our time and that can enhance the kind of subway experience and provide its orientation? Um, so the way I was thinking about doing this was through both landmarks and ethnic uh, sort of neighborhoods and pockets throughout the city. So this is, um, if you take the northwest corner in the 86th and Lexington station, it, this sort of less left exit takes you to Guggenheim. There's a little like Petco on the other corner on the side, which is like a little bit of a subtle thing with the animals. And this is how this looks sort of installed in the station. So it's this kind of blending of design sort of icons, but in a way that provides a little bit of beauty and a little bit of sort of orientation at that corner, that if you go out and see the Guggenheim one on the right, that's the one and then I went through a variety of blogs and images, Humans of New York, a variety of other things to look at people from these different neighborhoods and this sort of, um, if you can sort of represent in a more sort of contemporary way people from these different neighborhoods, then when you go to Curry Hill versus the Upper West Side versus the Upper East Side, you're getting a little bit of a visual identity for where the history is, especially as the city becomes more gentrified. And this is kind of what that one looks like. And so, and a lot of times just people providing directions for other people would be like, yeah, get out of the south corner, I guess. And if there's more of these kind of visual landmarks within the station, that's very helpful for orienting and sort of telling other people where to go. So in all in all, sort of where this project has been, where it's going, I'm more or less taking a bottom-up sort of guerrilla designer approach with the stairwell signs, and more of a top-down and sort of the Department of Transportation was passing this work along to the MTA, um, and thinking about different ways from very traditional signage to sort of non-traditional signage that we can address this issue of uh, subway orientation. Thank you. So this is a book that Carl uh, It's the standard menu. Um, and what I think is interesting about, and this is kind of is that we consider Matthew Modinelli's redesign of subway signage to be this like classic, iconic, kind of like coffee table thing. But at the same time, it's not really being applied in a way that's useful for us in the current time. I don't think the visuals 
partially bad, but it's not, it's their execution that is bad. And so part of what's probably just been about is rethinking what we sort of perceive to be this timeless thing and reimagining how it would actually be useful in the process. This is sort of, yeah, every day <laughs> <laughs> more investors that kind of stuff on the floor plans and thinking about showing uptown versus downtown and you know, here's a variety of comments uh, from different people. I got dozens of different emails um, in some of the sort of earlier branding style of stuff. This one the MCA did back in 2006, which um, people didn't really like. And the reason that these compasses really failed is because once you're outside the station, it's far easier to just look around, right? But there is that moment between when you get out of the or when you see like the northwest exit, and when you're actually outside, then you can have this very subtle kind of helpful piece of information. Um, and and the comments through some of the media stuff range from everything like we need a sign that says get off your freaking phones, like go up the <laughs> stairs, to like this is perfect, to like I wouldn't be able to use this, to didn't try this thing. So it's from a, a design perspective, I think being able to see that kind of all the comments, and I went through probably you know, two thousand different comments and tweets and you know, stuff. And it's fascinating to see sort of what people's different perceptions were of it. And I think that it's especially difficult with wayfinding to sort of measure whether something is successful because it's kind of like these things we know they're good. Andy? Yeah. Um, you talked about, when we talked uh, a couple of weeks ago, you talked about doing, or maybe I talked about it, but you did, we talked about this doing a style book so you could, because you were talking, I like the way that you've used like uh, participants and you've used the network media and then they've actually even interviewed people and got feedback for you. I think that's all brilliant and I wish we would see more of that in other people's projects. But you talked about the your inability to sort of tap there's so many subway tech stations you couldn't do all of them. So you, we talked about maybe producing a style book or a how to do these signs and the kind of guidelines that you would suggest. Did you do that? Or? Yeah so I had a list of um, sort of along the four five six line what signs would go where. And four or five people actually emailed me asking if they could help and replicate them. And I sent them there, but you know whether or not that will be executed. Um, I mean, it's a little bit of a tricky situation because it is getting a lot of buzz now and going for more up, I think, is risky. I mean, I had a meeting two days ago with some like Grizzlies lawyers about what was going to happen if I get sued and what's going to happen with the property. And, like, <laughs> so I'm like pushing it, but in a way that's not quite too far because I'm sort of working from both. But that was the sort of next step was publishing a list of if more people want to do this, here's the way you can do it. And it was essentially just what the text would read and what was just available to the Question? Yeah. 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 Uh, well, yeah. Um, so it, it, do you see this system, like I, I'm just, do you see the system as a replacement or is there? Sign, are, are there, all those signs on the ceiling in Penn Station, that like you would have full control of this, still exist? Or is this just like a band aid to get us to a point where we make this realization that signage is terrible and maybe this one simple improvement can kind of and start, start, to can start to help us consider that we actually really need to change the sign at all? Yeah, I think it's more sort of a latter point of showing that this sort of one piece that we don't think about, which is half like when you're a lot of internal station stuff that's showing that there's an opportunity there to make us reimagine sort of the way the whole system runs. Because, I mean, Penn Station is extremely confusing. And there were three different subway lines built by three different companies that then they sort of converged. And, I mean, the stations are confusing in and of themselves. So I think that it was sort of maybe a, a broader, um, sort of more holistic redesign to address that problem. Yeah, I mean, I look a lot at, um, it's really not something for the everyday commuter in terms of people who go through the station, because you might struggle two or three times, but then you know the exact car to get on, where you're exiting, like, the path to get around people best. 
Nor is it really for if someone who's never been to New York before, doesn't speak English, is just trying to find the net. Um, because regardless, and lots of people, even if they sort of knew where they were going, they would still pull out their phones to ask someone. But it's, there is a really just large chunk of the area of people going through the city, especially the station, um, that Google provides is just helpful. Wait, what, why is, what, part of the, um, what part of the Google is exciting to you? Or is Is that what was really exciting about approaching this and why I chose this kind of area was because it was embedded in all these sort of legal policy bureaucracy issues, but also it's a very tangible problem that everyone deals with. So I think for me what's interesting is trying to bring those two things together, where you're both making something that's helpful for people, but also is you know, you see the line on the, the implementation side as well. I think for me going in that was the most exciting, and coming out what has been Formative has been seeing all the the reaction to it, both positive and negative, and realizing how very sort of some people's opinions can be. Because I think that at RISD, you don't just get people like in the trolls yelling at you because you need to get rid of all the signs in the city and it's information overload and like that's not feedback that I get every day. I think without doing this, I might not have gotten that. So to that point, which is interesting. Which is interesting. Are we going to make a comment? Yeah. Two quick things that, um, so there is a connection at least between the internet and the so if you want to make any more questions, you can ask me. And there is, um, there is a RISD grad who actually runs the um, Transit Authority Art Project in DC. He's a, he's actually a really good resource for page hunting. Uh, my one comment is I would actually recommend you shy away from using any sort of person as an indicator because I think you're now trying to. Which to me could lead you to profile. Um, I think that using the, the physical landmarks that stay away from a, a typical type of person actually will serve you better in the long run. Um, oh, I've just got a question which I, I like. Um, do you think that talking to lots of somebody mentioned RISD bubble? Talking to people outside and then having to talk to all these press people as well. Do you think that, that because your presentation was really good, do you think that's helped me? <coughs> I mean, I think it's helped me um, realize my own biases, and this is why I was really happy to see some of in talking with the DNA info people that they interview people because I think I had kind of these rose colored lens on when I was interviewing people. Of you said it kind of helped you, okay, great, great job, and, and it's like <laughs> easy to fall into that. So I think for me, being able to like externalize some of that um, was really the most sort of helpful part of it. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'll stop. <laughs> 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 uh, no, yeah, it was a comment. It just Everybody told us to just don't put a question mark. Yeah, yeah. yeah. to the answer. So I don't want to give too fair. Any comments? Yes, one additional part is that um, I wish you had um, developed
how you can actually use that as another sort of medium for possibly the, the career extension that you're thinking about. Should you um, have these um, instructions that you're not allowed to take to the wall actually pop up on your phone if you get to plus six and you have all these things? Because you know, that is also an interesting um, challenge, which is not just applicable to transportation, but you know, wayfinding, which is becoming a very big thing in the rural offices. I guess I wondered if you did any research on other subway systems and train stations, you know, maybe in Europe or in other countries. Yeah, the Asian ones were by far the sort of trendsetters. And the difference is the way that the transportation approaches run are very different in cities. So one of the things run on the mayor's office, for example, whereas the MTA has Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. So the sort of how things are implemented really depends on whether or not you're getting a lot of public funding for turning into one of the subway stations. And that's probably what I learned the most from looking at different cities. Thank you. There's two places for them. 
you can either buy them or people teach things online. That's the world of products, right? So then I started looking at websites that buy things, that sell things, and websites that teach things. So my two case studies were on Etsy and on Instructables. Um, and I started looking at the comments, and these happen to be in Portuguese and Spanish because I was looking at the bottle cutter, and um, that's where I found like the most to use. Um, and a lot of the comments on the making, because I found places that sell, both sell it and places that teach people how to make it, and the comments on either one was, on the website that sells the product was like, okay, this is really cool, but I think I can make it myself. Can you teach me how to make it? And on the website that that teaches you how to make it says, that's really cool, but like I don't have a wood shop. Can I just buy it from you? So then I thought there could be a place where those things overlap. Um, and so I'm doing a case study with two different users, and these are real people. The picture is kind of a placeholder because I want to be respectful of these people, but Mateos is a person from this community that I've worked with closely, and he is kind of an inventor there, and he makes these great tools but they don't really have a place to leave the community. Ethan is an example of someone who has spare time on his weekends, has a little bit of spending money, has access to internet, and wants to be kind of a tinker, but doesn't necessarily have access to a full shop. So what do those two people, where can they converge? Um, they meet on the internet, right? Because that's where um, like the platforms for people from different backgrounds are. And so I'm proposing that there could be a place where you can make, build, and buy things. Because um, the same product can be disseminated in these three different ways, right? And so basically, I do not want you to read this chart. The general idea is that in the make version, it's a DIY tutorial from scratch. The build version um, is a kit for assembly, and the buy version is a ready-to-use product. But ultimately, it's the same product that can just be disseminated in three different ways. So um, really quickly, I'll run you through what each person would do on this website. Um, this is user A. He logs in, and I'm showing these four icons on the bottom because the idea is I don't want to compete with any of the existing um, platforms. I kind of want to work with them. So if you have an Etsy account, you can just log in through your Etsy account and uh, upload your products through that. Same with Instructables, right? Because a lot of people have both of those accounts, um, according to the research that I did. And then you upload your product, you put the links and photos, and then again, I don't want to compete. I don't want to invent a new system for shipping and for payment. There's already so many different ways that you can do that online, so I just would use some of the that. And then you click make, build, or buy. So how does Mateos want to teach or disseminate his technology, right? Does he want to post an a tutorial, an instructable? Does he want to sell a kit for you to assemble it? Or does he want to sell you his finished product? He could do either of them or all three of them. It depends on whatever the person wants to do. Then you press to submit. Then my next user is user B, right? The other person goes onto the website um, and he will click on the matrix, right? And in this matrix, I've actually replaced um, I've replaced um, uh, quality and effort with cost and skill, right? Because those are just the ways that you think about products. And so he can actually search for things according to how much time he has or how much money he's willing to spend on his um, project for the weekend. And then different things will show up um, on the search thing. Then he'll click on the product that he wants to make or build or buy. And that's a touch point between the two users, right? So then, um, Basically, this slide shows that what's important about this website is not necessarily the products, but it's kind of about the connections that it makes and about the different people that are using it. Um, and the opportunity is kind of for people who are already making things, right? To either the makers who are teaching free tutorials on Instructables to kind of take that a step further and make a little bit of money by selling some of their kits. And for the people who are buying things on Etsy to get involved in the making process because I found that people value that so much and even websites that sell things are starting to reveal a lot more process. Some of the earlier presentations today show that process um, and showing um, the way that the handmade aspect of things is really becoming higher appreciated nowadays. So basically, um, that's really the opportunity that I wanted to share with you guys. And special thanks to everybody that was involved. <laughs>
don't know if the, the bottle cutting thing, is that like a, is that like a cotton narrows from Brazil thing, people who are trash collectors trying to turn something into a product? And if so, does this, is this aimed towards people in the developing world or people in the first world? Okay, so really great questions. Um, I answered the one about make.com first yeah. because, yeah, so the, I did lots of case studies on lots of different websites that teach things. And I, I realized that there is a huge audience that likes to make things, but they wouldn't call themselves a maker. And there's people who appreciate handmade things that, aren't, that don't necessarily have access to all the shops, but it's really, really special when you have a small hand in the product that you're, that you're using. So I definitely would, like Instructables, for example, has a lot of the maker, hacker, tinker people, but they also have, they, I mean, the most popular Instructable, um, and I heard this from a source that someone who works in Instructable, is how to make fake sweet potatoes. So um, that one has like 7 million hits. So really there's a whole range of people who are, want to learn and want to engage with websites and, and then communicate with each other on it. So I posted Instructables for how to make this thing and within a day I had a thousand hits. Um, and so I think that yes, it is for the make.com type of hacker, but it's also for anybody who's interested in just having a hand in their product. And those people are already on those websites. Like I think we have stereotypes about it and, when you go on to Instructables, you'll see that there's actually a really wide range of users on that website. Um, in answer to the question about the actual tool, so um, I work with D-Lab, which is one of my partners, on a summit there in 2012 in Brazil, and they came up with lots of different products, and this is actually, the original bottle stripping tool is done by these Japanese artisans who live in Brazil, but they taught it to this community with the idea of like economic empowerment and getting people to make products out of their tools. But I think that um, having um, participated in the establishment of an innovation center there, um, I was there at the beginning of the innovation center, I didn't necessarily do anything to help it get started, but I was there. Um, I realized that there's lots of avenues for people to get started and get involved and get engaged with the, with the center. And so to bring this place from beyond just like a school, like a, like a technical place where you learn things, to get people engaged with things. So yeah, that could be an opportunity, but it also is a means for people to start making products, and the best ideas do come from the people who are hands-on and dealing with um, limited resources every day. So. That's a great question. So um, I thought about that. There's a kind of really two avenues that something can go when you reveal your process, right? And it can either be, wow, that person put so much time and effort I'm going to value it a lot more. The other one is like, seriously, like she just laser cut those things. Like, that's so easy. I'm not going to buy that in right? So I was definitely interested in that question. I think that um, for, mo for the research survey that I did, the answer that people gave me was that for handmade objects, when they learn the process, they value it more of, of overwhelming majority of them. For manufactured goods, you wouldn't want to show like the person in whatever factory in X city somewhere on the assembly line. But when something is handmade, if people see the process, they really value it a lot more. So you do run a little bit of the risk, but I also think that the person, the audience that's gonna buy your product is not necessarily the same audience that's gonna be making it because um, it's a time, skill, cost thing, right? So the person who wants to buy it doesn't have time, they don't have the tool, they don't have anything. The person making it is not gonna be the person who's gonna buy it because they have the time, they have the interest in wanting to learn it. So, it would be two different people, and that's where the middle ground is. And I think uh, when I was having a conversation with Ryan about this, it's not necessarily actually three different pillars. It's kind of a spectrum. And so the middle one is like the, what I call build, but you could kind of provide like a tutorial, like a kit of parts. So if you make these necklaces out of like uh, ceramic beads, you can give the person like the materials, and then they have to provide their own glaze and their own oven and whatever, whatever. So you can find a middle ground um, to get people to participate in the making, but not necessarily give them exactly what they need in order to make it themselves and then become your competitor because you wouldn't want that. Great. Um, so, I'd like to hear a little bit more. You talk a lot about research, which is really, really great, but I'd like to hear a little more about your, your validation, um, uh, whether it's a reaction to the proposed website or, um, you know, whatever it is, but, you know, throughout your process, I feel like most of your references Yeah, so um, I really started my process for a semester kind of studying the way that people use things. And so 
I think I, it's safe to say up until now, it has been mostly my own kind of learning about the way that people use things. And the kind of the product that you see here, like this interactive website approach, has kind of been over the past few weeks, just it kind of culminated in this format for me to present it. Um, but I have spoken to people at Etsy and at Instructables, and they do want to see more of this work because they think that there is some kind of opportunity there to be integrated into the things that already exist on both of their websites. And I have seen, just in the last month, um, Etsy introduced um, a kind of system for their app. You can now upload pictures of the things that you buy. So when you buy their products, um, you can there's a whole like Tumblr kind of newsfeed where um, you can show like, oh look, I'm wearing the bracelet and like 12 different people can put up pictures. And Instructables has the I made it button that you upload your own story. So I think that that's kind of where this thing would fit into this. So I was kind of just looking for a place where I could insert this project, but I haven't um, had the opportunity yet to actually implement it. So. Um, I got Yeah, I think that that's a really interesting point that I didn't have a chance to include here because it was a joint kind of presentation. But definitely the idea of community and the idea that this website is not really about the, I mean, it is about the products, but more than that, it's about the community. And like the quote at the beginning said, it's about like a tool is just a means for, for social interactions, right? And so I think that that having this feedback loop and, and both all websites now they have a comment thing and that the person who originally uploaded the post can also comment. And so I think that there are opportunities for that. I think that's an interesting one. Comment for four minutes. So I, I observed you as a very energetic and dynamic conduit between these two like the builders of the maker or uh who has made build uh, right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Curious what you in this process what you felt like was new. Like it seems like a lot of it is a result of these limitations that you had mm. in like constructing something or you know, knowing material science or like where have you kind of bounced around in like oh well, yeah. I could go really deep into that, but maybe I'll move away and do something more in this space. So where were the big the the big roadblocks that resulted in yeah, um, so material science was a bigger roadblock initially. Um, one of my advisors were, um, was one of the, well, was the founding team of Ristify, which aided a lot um, later on in the process with kind of validating ideas around what we're working on with this and their material sciences. Um, but with that, um, I think creating an environment that still fit within the lifestyle range without getting like, too high tech or trying to create something that was too extreme for the So I think I kept kind of going back and forth between my technology, like, oh, I can utilize this, I can go this far with this, um, but it doesn't still fall within um, like the necessary features for my lifestyle. Question. Can you talk a little bit about that lifestyle design that you're using? Yeah. Um, so the, the, the goal of my garment isn't to change the core body temperature, like most um, uh, garments, like steam garments, um, it's more so to increase the hunger for the sensation of being able to go down, which is why it's meant to work in conjunction with an external device, such as the one introduced by Crystal Five, where you can radiate the heat throughout the conductive channels of the garment, you can fill the conductive channels of the garment, 
um, or the error would increase in the service area in events that the point sensation provided by the device and the load of the network would be there. Um, so it's more psychological than the sensation. It's more sensory than it is um, extremely um, Comments? Yes. Yeah. Um, you Yeah, I mean, what I was getting at is kind of where the piece going was that I think that your uh, some of your abilities to you know construct with this material and like it was limiting you from actually visualizing the idea and being able to communicate it in a way where you could actually talk through the future. And even if you couldn't make it, even if it wasn't real, like you could find other ways to design this garment without actually having to know how to make it. Yeah. Um, thought that I was really impressed by the fact that you were actually you know, working through those things and, and it did inform the ideas to an extent, but it was much more that it shaped some of the kind of uh, more of the scientific aspect of what you were trying to achieve by visualizing and making that into a simulation. Yeah, I wanted to take a quick look through one or two users. So we started with the people who were commuting to work or class on Monday. Uh, but then we threw the kid in and I don't see the kid school. Yeah. Um, but I started thinking about this. Um, you know, there so the commuters is one population, but think about and you may not know anything about this, but think about a menopausal woman whose body temperature changes like at a, at a drop of a hat. I watch my mother take off layers of clothes sometimes in public, which can be slightly embarrassing. Um, but that's how she regulates. So something like this for you is a perfect solution. And you're now talking about something that that back to some of our other points about that, hey, this also could be something that has a, a value from a fashion standpoint as well as a function standpoint. So you started with the commuter, you know, the bicycle commuters and like that. Um, but again, I think it's it's picking one type of user and digging deeper into that user that I would give a general advice for everybody that I think we tried to cover every user in eight minutes and that's impossible. Pick one, focus on that, and dig deeper about the value. And the examples of Here's where it is on the heat map on the bottom. Here's where it is on the Don't try to, it's not a one size fits all. Yep. Um, pick a user and stick with that. Stick with that user and dig deeper and it'll, add, it'll provide more value. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also thinking about the production side of this. You know, manual cleaning and sewing back then, or back then, manual, um, versus a woven sort of body pattern that you might have to
Tom's like, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a brilliant comment, though. Feathers are an amazing structure. They really have built-in vents, and they're superb. So feathers just need you in a good direction. Make a fist out of and the title of my project is To Save a Life. IEDs, mass shootings, riots, bombings, conflict, war. Violence is nothing new. Conflict isn't modern. The world is simply a hazardous place. Like evolution, technology evolves to protect ourselves from danger all the time. Seatbelts, airbags, bicycle helmets, safety glasses, rubber gloves, bulletproof vests. Technology and innovation has given a way to fend off nearly any conceivable hazard. However, there's a price. Holistic protection can cost a leg and an arm. But if you can't afford it, it can literally cost an arm and a leg. <laughs> Those doing the fighting always seem to have the protection they need. But what about the common folk, the civilian? All over the world, non-combatants are dragged into conflict. How are they supposed to protect themselves? That was what I wanted to find out. Improvised armor, homemade remedies, protection, not usually avail available, but buildable. First, I didn't know what I was up against. The reality is, in hotspots around the world, bullets aren't the primary killing force. It's the secondary effects of explosives and shrapnel. In a study of com combat injuries during the Iraq War of 1,565 cases, only 38 of those were from gunshot wounds. That's only 2.4%. The repeating trend I kept seeing was damage from high velocity spawning and shrapnel. The kinds of damage is not always life threatening. Let me make myself clear. To save a life, you don't just have to keep someone from dying. A person's life can be ruined in all sorts of ways, such as just by being injured in the first place. My original concentration for this project, to find ways to protect vulnerable areas of the human body from life-threatening and life-altering injuries, such as the hands, the eyes, the joints. These are places where ballistic protection lags behind what technology should be able to do. I started looking at true ballistic grade vision protection, flexible hand protection, and innovative methods of stopping bullets. I conducted a number of tests for what is being called electric armor, a sort of built-in force field for thin sheet metal plates. This works on the principle of dampening high current through a penetrating projectile, destroying it or upsetting its velocity. These first tests were looking favorable at a small scale. 
However, I moved on to other forms of protection as the power requirements and equipment necessary to test became more and more cumbersome. I began testing with candid joint armor, composition varying in the materials I would use. These tests proved extremely successful in their first iterations, not only stopping dangerous simulated travel, but even true bullet threats, such as the common 9mm or 45 ACP handgun gun. It was during these tests that I discovered something worth further investigation. One of the materials I developed was a lightweight aluminum disc, arranged like scales. The material proved not only flexible, but easy to build. It offered the best protection that I could have imagined for a material of its thickness. The ease at which they could be arranged and put together with simple duct tape was a kind of improvised homemade armor I was looking for. The question was, how could I better evolve the system into one more easily reproduced? The answer was the coin. Coin exists everywhere on Earth, or at least everywhere there's conflict. Not only are they cheap, they're also sturdy and excellent at building things from. It was time to explore every possibility of this new development. I began testing. I tested the composition of coins by the year of manufacture. I duplicated the experiments with different sizes, different nations. <laughs> I found better patterns. My original scale design, while useful under some circumstances, became obsolete through the new box arrangement, which provided the exact same ballistic protection while being more flexible, faster to make, and much longer lasting when held together with duct tape. The adhesive was just as an important component as the coin. Samples from multiple tapes were tested, looking at which ones were easiest to work with, which ones resisted delamination, and which ones offered the most flexibility. I conducted long-term durability tests. It was here the scale pattern showed its inferiority to the box pattern. With these findings, I began writing instructables, posting step-by-step -step tutorials online for people to make their own armor, hoping to protect people with the greatest armor of all, knowledge. <laughs> Today, I'm still refining and advancing my techniques to use this coin armor. I've begun to look into ways to ease the assembly process by developing pre-made elastic sleeves. Anyone with coins alone can make armor that even holds up better. I feel it is my responsibility to make the world a safer place. If I could have developed a product or a solution that could save one life, that's a step in the right direction. Thank you for your time. So, the coin thing is fascinating, um, and that it's not something I would consider as an application. Um, how do you, you know, have you determined the, the appropriate number? Is it is it related to the size and weight of the individual wearing it? You know, if you're teaching people how to create this, it, it doesn't seem to me that it's a one size fits all. Right? So, there's multiple best for variations in size and weight. So how do you translate that in this particular way? Well, designing a formula that's so easily modifiable by the, the user, they themselves can test what works best for them. For example, uh, but, but I don't know if I want to test the <laughs> 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 so kind of yeah. yeah. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> um, I might say that the 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 looks nice, but works really bad. Like, you don't actually use that. So I made sure that in my instructable when I do examples of what the pattern's supposed to look like, I warn the user not to use that. The no. Well, I would argue this is a defensive product made to save a person. This is not offensive in any manner. So did you... Try to shoot these patterns? These have been shot so many different times, yes. 
Shot with a shotgun. Yep, three inch magnet, the heaviest uh, loading. From can. what distance? 25 yards. You shot a thing this size from 25 yards? <laughs> 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 they make up a lot of things in movies. Shotguns are more accurate line range than people think. Kind of fire. I also did a number of uh, handgun tests, which is those bigger scale picks are going around, as I needed to find the exact thickness of 6061 aluminum. But it's too thick, it's too heavy, and it's too thin level. So, is this. Uh, right, so, so, like, the whole point is, is getting the knowledge, you know, that's not necessarily this. Um, like, I wonder if there were. Like, have you thought about other ways to get this message across that didn't end up in, like, an instructable to make your own? Like, are there other courses you might? To make it think like maybe it's like a more tongue in cheek campaign. I mean, I love the idea of using different coins from different countries and testing them and shooting them, and that's really funny. Like, I wonder if you could use some of that to actually elevate this awareness even a bit more. Right. Yeah. I don't know if you, I, I, again, uh, like, besides just making the instructables, I'm going to start, well, I'm going to put posts on blogs pointing back to my instructables to try and get more traffic. But that's it. Ultimately, as an idea, it's grand, but it's not a very good product. I'm not making any money just giving people an idea of how to protect themselves. It would be nice if I were, just produce, were producing some sort of ready-made piece that only needed the coins, such as that's an early prototype. In which case, then you don't even need tape. You just need the coins in the first place, and then you can buy this cheap, easy to manufacture piece of cloth. Um, the design style, that, it's funny because that's one of those um, base bandage wraps. But while looking at that, I was thinking the usability of something, you wouldn't need a vest, you could simply wrap that around your arm in a manner that a bulk of that vest simply can't do. Yeah, I, I would want you to leverage your expertise if you clearly have and understand it. Um, and, and that, beyond just giving the idea to someone who might be in one of these conflict situations, giving them uh, your expertise as a sort of assurance that like, you're going to do it right. That's a very good point. As I was making the instructable, I kept thinking to myself, people are going to look at this and they're going to laugh. They're going to think, oh, this is ridiculous. This won't work. But you really have to prove the method. Otherwise, like, well, penny, that's not going to stop anything. But the same exact stuff, the exact same shotgun, the exact same range that I shot, those plates that you're passing around, I hit this ballistic clay hand with, and that's not so pretty. So that's a pretty good simulation of what would happen to the human body. And that coin armor will stop this from happening entirely. I know I, I missed like the third minute of your presentation, so sorry about that. But so and maybe you address that. But what is what is this supposed to be like competing with? What is this offering a solution to? This is offering a solution to those that don't have a solution. If you are stuck in a country or a hotspot or chaos, anywhere in America, any country, and you don't have access to any form of protection, now you can make it on your own. But I don't have like I feel like I need that. Also, there's the weight issue. I mean, like, you know, they're, they're, it's heavy. It's, it's a little bit of So, so just a couple things from, a, and I'm not, the legal, I'm not, no, it's, it's Tom, I'm not the legal expert, but in the United States, not pennies, but every other court is legal tender. So be very careful about what federal law you're violating. Making something 
with money that it's not intended to. It, it's funny that you mentioned that because I was assuming someone would say something along the lines of that. So I had to look up all the laws, and it was that you can A, for an art project, case falls under the First Amendment of status of expression of conduct, where you can face things that are the government's. And Title 18, Chapter 17 of the U.S. Code relates to the destruction of coins in regards of debasing, which is removing or melting down the precious metal, precious metal of the coin and putting it back into circulation. The U.S. Treasury, Treasury explicitly states no mutilation under any conceivable cir circumstance is allowed, but that only is in regard to banknotes and paper money. Huh. So, the other thing, just for a couple of things, one is I, I would say anything you're doing on a chart goes, you, you should hire a lawyer quickly to have some sort of legal disclaimer that the, old, the thing you don't want to happen is somebody to go out and take this and put their buddy out and shoot the shotgun and it not work and that killed them because... The very last thing my tire struck bullet is this product is not guaranteed to save any lives, safety first, think before you act, and and in fact, I think I have a sentence that's literally, don't shoot yourself or shoot others while breaking. Well, what was the comment? Yeah, uh, my comment is uh, <laughs> <laughs> to look at that yes. and make sure it says the right thing. I am not a lawyer, so that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah. 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 
living in a world right now where, I mean, yeah, it might as well be post apocalyptic. Like, that's what everyone's thinking. That's like the culture of all the television we're watching, all the movies. You can see everything culturally kind of reflecting this deep seated fear um, as things tend to downward spiral. But what I would love to see is I want you to take this a step further, and maybe I'm just like totally pushing this in a plurality thing right now. But I want to see a page for this online. That coin statement was amazing. <laughs> where there's like coin, yeah. Where there's conflict? Yeah. 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 yeah, I want to see that emblazoned across the website. I want to see your instructable there, but like telling people how to make this themselves. Careful lawyer on it. But like, I just want to see this as like tools to protect yourself in this like post apocalyptic type of environment. So I think you haven't got the tone quite right yet. And we keep talk, we've talked about this quite a bit, and, I, and I, we never checked out the numbers, but I just had a quick look, and the, the number of kids in Syria that have died, according to this statistic, roughly speaking, from, not from bullets, it's like 9,000 kids, and you're sort of saying that, I think you're saying you could have saved a lot of those kids, and I, and I think that to me is like a totally amazing argument, um, and you just sort of, I know you're geeking out materials and everything like that, you kind of, that's your real passion. Yeah. But I think that argument's a really strong one. Yeah. Well, what would this look like for a kid who doesn't want to be terrified their entire life when they're walking around just wanting to write code that calls them a really good friend? But, but I think this, the, 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 the context is, oh, shit, we're in the middle of it. We didn't want to be in this situation, but we are. What can, how can we protect ourselves? And I think that, to me, is the scenario. And it's a really powerful one. And I, I, I mean, I like, you know, like Lions Press. I think you can get something like if you do push it forward, we need more time to go on. So like you have access to the flying room, you have access to the model shop, you have access to I mean the, the quality of core and, and the final sort of we need to push this out of our And um, for this semester, I uh, I'll get to uh, pretty much this concept of prep in a few minutes, but I'll walk you through kind of where my source of inspiration for even looking at uh, open source lighting is what I'm calling this project, and why um, it serves a purpose and why it's important. Um, I started out with a uh, sort of general idea of uh, how design sort of fails and can uh, bring difference in underserved communities. Um, when, uh, you know, I'm from West Philadelphia, and being around that environment uh, all my life, I got to see how there are so many opportunities for design to just do something small to bring new life to a space. Um, during my, most of my research, I looked at uh, sort of systems that exist, um, how um, exist in the context of providence. So I started thinking of place making, how do we see that system of making murals, um, gaining an urban sense of agency, controlling what happens in your neighborhood, building an urban garden, um, and safety. Uh, while I'm using an example of what is known as on presence, um, what's going on in New York, um, that's also a dynamic to how neighborhoods, uh, mood, and attitude is affected. 
So in Providence, sorry about the blurring of this map, but pretty much I found a map of uh, the neighborhoods in Providence, Rhode Island, by crime rate. Dark blue being most safe, uh, gray being uh, uh, not too safe. Um, and I found this map pretty much trying to question uh, what are they basing this on? Is it just uh, particular crimes? Is it the atmosphere? Is it the particular quality of the community? Um, and I decided to visit the intersection of Smith and Lawrence to find that they had this pretty nice park here that was kind of just ignored. Um, there was some activity I got to see during the day with people actually using the basketball court playground in the back. Um, but at night, it's pitch black and it disappears in space. Um, so thinking about how we have these um, existing infrastructures that could be celebrated better to bolster our community, I started to think of like, well, what can I do? Um, and sorry, this is a little aside, but another reason was drawing me, which drew me to that particular location. This is a bus frequency map of projects. And this is my area. Delay in uh, bus services, but that also felt was relevant to the community that was more uh, utilitarian uh, painting of the space. So my mission became how to retrofit um, existing infrastructure with aesthetic ambient lighting to affect the mood of the space. Um, and then this question branched into since Ripta was doing service in uh, this uh, intersection of Smith and can having a better light at night since. 15 minutes more than usual at night in a space that's pitch black, can um, using light in some way bring a level of comfort um, that hasn't been there previously. So um, this is where we're getting into these cool kits. Sorry about this. Um, so pretty much what we have here is a laser cut uh, sheet metal. Here's a built version. Um, strip LED lightings with uh, uh, adhesive on the back is waterproof. And shoelacing for connections. Um, the tool, uh, the, uh, the instruction guide for how to put this actually get a safe bus book. But, um, so, still can't get that image quite right, but you can see on the left image, I took a bus stop and near the intersection of Smith and Lawrence and just applied this light that had this perforated pattern, similar to what we see here. And it just created a sort of sense of mood around. Clearly not existent before, um, and yet a lighting can be a lot stronger. But just a sense of how can you activate a space just with light, so people can one notice it and be engaged by it. Um, these are the few models I went through, um, playing with pattern, playing with material with the final one here, um, and here's a, another view of just how this preparation can create some really fun space. Um, kind of get a level of pattern from this particular perforation. So there's this artistic exploration. There's sort of a look into um, sort of a activism in design and how you can use something as simple as a toolkit of making your own street light and allow communities to affect their own space. Um, it also came with a dynamic of how and through what channels Greatly, great, most effectively impact the city. So I looked at community groups in Providence, such as the Twin uh, Design Council for Design for the Arts, and compared that to what the city is able to provide, which is citizen investor responsible for the for the city's RIPTA, and they also have sort of some connection to that, but on different levels. Um, and sort of the dynamic of what does it mean for the um, uh, actual installation of a knowing about light as an issue, but not having the best idea of where to install light, um, became a dynamic that I'm still working out the answers for. And what's the best way to get somewhere in the middle where there's a um, uh, symbiosis between how these lights are uh, being brought to communities. So that's essentially my project. Thank you.
get a sense of how many unique unique styles of crypto are in the world today? I would say there's there's three crypto bus styles. The heart is surrounded by some type of uh, street holes that do have money, but they don't affect they don't spill into the park itself. I would say about four or four six. That's a pretty big margin, but I would say that that would create a nice uh, activating of that space because I don't intend this to be surveillance. Like that's one thing. Uh -huh. um, it's all about seeing these patterns on the ground, so it's really soft light. But to have that many would definitely bring the vibe. And if you had to put a uh, production price on, on that curve, mm -hmm. what would that model be? See, now that's the tricky part. Uh, I'm considering the material still. Um, this is 16 gauge. Um, that could definitely be something smaller than 20, uh, which would bring the sheet and the laser cutting. Um, I, at least I paid 80 for the laser, the material and the laser cutting. But which would drop, drop, which would drop the, the mass production. And that would be a very, like that's not realistic for what I'm talking about. These communities not only have these resources. So where I'm kind of looking into how to curve that. Feasibility to this, um, mm -hmm. and still be talking to them, and still know them on the map, like how do they go about projects like the trash can that they did. Yeah. And one quick last question: is, yeah. How do you find the power source? So I had two ideas for how this could be. Like this is pretty much like a um, where it's like more like you plug this in and like lights come out. I don't know where now, but there is. Oh. Um, so like in the model I showed in the presentation, that would be a solar panel version um, because that would definitely take the person, the community leader or whoever, um, who's on the more community side, out of worrying about going into the grid and chart the, yeah, let's close that down. Yeah. Um, and pretty much that would make it free for them. Yeah, we probably should turn the lights out. <laughs> Um, and I'm just imagining this being bolted to like a uh, existing telephone pole. Something like that. Yeah, you don't really see <laughs> with this light, but um, yeah. Did that answer your question? Uh -huh. Sorry, I don't know. No, 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 no. Sorry. Their perception was um, half and half, so I'm not very positive. Like, there's times where you know, I'm not out here waiting for the bus, but I do walk around to go to point A to point B, and this particular space is dark. Maybe I don't feel intimidated because it's in my neighborhood, but it would be good to have light there. And um, though at first I took that as like a, a killing this project, I was like, well, this is still bringing some beauty. Um, and then on the other hand, a lot of people were just pretty much like, oh, that's cute, light it up, <laughs> like, light the face up. So I got to look into um, a lot of what um, <coughs> the broken window uh, theory, uh, Jane Jacobs, where, um, where what I'm trying to convince this project is that I'm not saying that by having this light, <coughs> you're not going to get robbed or other attack. Like, nothing will prevent you from crime, except other safe practices. Um, anyway, so pretty much, this is pretty much serving a more along the lines of placemaking, more along the lines of activating a space in a uh, more homely way. Um, and I'm still trying to figure out ways of getting the community involved. Um, the 
playing with the ideas of instructables. I like some of the examples that I played with solid patches you could make build by concept that might be like um, and um, so pretty much like letting this be a solution that can be addressed from both the municipal and urban um, level. Um, so maybe that that means a website that people can like download this template slash toolkit um, and go to a local um, producer like AS220. They already have a green in the city um, and can produce these for people. Um, that's still kind of idealistic. I'm still working out the ins and outs of that, but that's kind of the goal of what I'm seeing as open source. That would definitely be relying on getting more study, doing more tests, getting more opinion from people. Um, one thing I was really trying to avoid, um, and was really nervous, I'm not sure if I really was supposed to do it or not, but a lot of urban place making projects, they kind of have this persona of like expert coming into the community um, and changing whatever. And then that has this initial ties of like gentrification and yeah. like the with communities and design. So um, it would really be Continue. Uh, definitely work on my people's skills and get that feedback. Can I have a comment? Yeah, I love that the, I mean, since you referenced, uh, you know, <coughs> like growing up in Philly, I love that the community is back into the urban community and like that the original had those, that emotional connection, yeah. um, especially as someone who might be able to make a connection with the community already having relatives there. Mm -hmm. I think that would be really cool. And then also figuring out, you know, the whole background. <laughs> I just think there's so much value um, in so many, reconfining what the other values are, bringing community together. Mm -hmm. To bring community together to create a project that gives them identity and, and shared, shared understanding. Um, providing the safety of some of those who perform. Uh, you know, this, this to me really has a social impact that makes it really, really good, but also really excited about the potential and outcomes of it. Um, kudos. very original in your way of looking at the whole space and approaching it with like, because you started with pot and then you started with consulting. It's very interesting. And the way that you were talking about it, you know, the slide shows uh, the presence that the space has with the light and then how that's just a huge, um, so effective. It's like, 
for them was more like a pretty spotlight in the whole picture. So we might be saying, well, who could they persuade that will be there to kind of try to change the tradition that we have? And to be able to articulate what makes your voice different from the child can help you to make a choice for what is important. Can you make any comments on that? Yeah. I just want to say that um, I don't know who planned on sticking around in projects after graduation, but for me, having worked in projects for the past um, I feel like this is a huge opportunity for even just families or graduates to get more involved with the community because there is a huge need, not even this or that, but for getting um, recent graduates to start taking the bus. Like, I know so <laughs> many of my friends who avoid taking the bus because they don't feel like, I don't know, whatever reason, they don't feel like they're part of the community or they don't feel like And I feel like that's just <coughs> growing the gap between the local community and... And to that point, <laughs> like, if you can... <laughs> Sorry. <Yeah. laughs> and, and to that point, I think yeah. it might be interesting to, um, to think about the other uh, urban furniture that you considered um, quite important for the gap. Can you see what are the other problems that prevent people from, for example, working at a bus stop? A, it's dark. B, maybe there's nowhere to sit in your a lot of stuff in your 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 elderly um, or pregnant and you know see it may be raining or cold and what can you do with shelter like are there some other sorts of you know interesting community driven crowdsourced um sort of low cost designs that could that could facilitate more a more easily safer experience um moving into the city. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Well, they, I did a um, survey of 
can genuinely put the link below. And there's a little bit curious about the how, where, and why of recycling things on plastic. So, I can give some answers. But they're all kind of boring. <laughs> what I wanted to do is engage with this topic in a more meaningful, compelling way. So, I designed this demo series to help people change their mindset about things on plastic. So, what am I going to do with this demo series is make pins. You can put them on stuff. They're really fun and festive. I'm wearing one right now. <laughs> um, this is close-ups. So I ran this workshop series several times on the Razor campus and also at Whole Foods. And every time it was really well received with all the smiling people. <laughs> um, and this is the workshop setup. So I'm going to take you through as if you had just come here to, run, to be part of my workshop. Um, but first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. So, the aim of the workshop is to educate people about how and where to recycle their things on plastic, to provide them with a memorable demo experience, and to allow you, the participants to walk away with a tangible artifact. Um, so, the first stage when you come to my workshop is you're going to learn a little something. So, I made these posters, but that's not really how I grab them. I grab them with these. These are pre pressed plastic sheets. Here, you can touch them, because this is exactly what I do. People come. <laughs> And once they're touching it, they're like, oh, this is so interesting. I'm so curious. What are you doing? And what I say, interested person, is it just plastic bags that I press together with pretty much an iron? But we use a taco press, because in ITU we have a taco press. <laughs> so I make all of this sheet plastic prior to the event, and I bring it to them. And when I'm telling them about this sheet plastic, I'm also slipping in, like, oh, did you know that you recycle plastic bags? And they're like, whoa. As like, oh, <laughs> and I'm like, did you know that we only recycle 13%? And they're like, oh. So now that I've talked to them a little something about plastic bags, I want them to actually make something, get their hands dirty with recycling, because who doesn't learn better with a more tactile experience? So you have three ways to play. You can use one of my pre made molds, these are some geometric ones you see here. You can assemble your initials out of the laser cut letters, because who doesn't love a little narcissism? Or <laughs> you can use um, plasticine, uh, non drying clay, to make whatever shape you want. And then we'll form it for you. So, the process I use to actually make the pins is a vacuum form process. So, uh, essentially, we heat the plastic and then we suck it down. I say over a reverse air hockey table because people can relate to that. Um, and then we make these personalized pins. <laughs> so, this is just a breakdown of the process. We got Oh, this where it works. We got the machine, we got the um, forms that you're going to go around, you have this pre pressed plastic. It comes out of the machine looking sort of like this, this three dimensional thing, and then we cut it out and make it into a nice little piece for you. Uh, and then here's the assembly station. So at the assembly station, we're going to hit you with one last little sign, and this is about other things that things on plastic need, because it's not just pins, it's also in a lot of decking, they use it to make new plastic bags. Bottles out of it, there's furniture being made out of this stuff, so it's a really recyclable resource beyond just like the home use. Um, and then, most importantly, we have all of our participants put the scraps from their pins into the recycling bin. They did it! They learned the lesson, they recycled the plastic. It's very exciting. Um, so, what is the trajectory from here now that I've run some successful workshops and the team are comfortable with that? Uh, what I didn't let you know is there's actually money involved. Um, so, we talked about our, 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 we talked about the recycling center, RIRRC, and they had to turn off their machines every four hours to undo them, which is a huge cost to them in terms of manpower and the fact that they're not having their recycling system up and running. Um, so what I'd like to do is capitalize on that and have my system live with them, train RIRRC people to uh, do this demo because it's pretty straightforward. You just press two buttons, heat and form. Um, and then have them disseminate this into partnerships with uh, major retail and grocery stores, which I've already done some of the groundwork for. Uh, and hopefully, through this partnership, we'll reach lots of interested consumers. And it'll be a lot of fun, and people will learn. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty much me. <laughs> Not the one at your home.
have to have those recycling bins provided at grocery and retail stores. Okay. They're mandated by law to have recycling bins that they put out selling plastic. Okay. Um, I imagine that that is a tension point for local people to actually yes. um, get their bag from home to the supermarket. Mm -hmm. um, did you think in your process at all about trying to make that process easier? Yeah, I thought a lot about doing a home recycling system of some kind, but the problem that we're talking about is volume, because people kind of like to hold on to their plastic bags, like they've got dogs that poop, they've got like clothes that get wet, and they've got trash cans that need to fill in. So generally, they, people have this notion that they need a lot of plastic bags, even though they don't. So, and, but there is that one breaking moment where you find this drawer that's just gobs and gobs and gobs of plastic bags, and you want to do something with it, so probably in frustration, you'll just throw it out, or that's at least what um, people in Mexico have said. So it's more about making them aware of this infrastructure so that when they do have that breaking point, they know they have a good channel to know what to do. Um, you, so you said there's money in this, and I understand like from the recycling people's point of view. Do you? Oh, there's you another spot of money that we forgot. <laughs> So Trex runs some systems like that already in their community outreach programs, but the way that that works is that they um, will run their competitions, like a school might compete against another school, who can recycle the most bags, because the plastic bag isn't a big overhead for them, like they didn't pay for it, but not absorbed in amounts in their process. Uh, they don't have a lot of incentive to make a deal with like one person for a deck, and also it doesn't have to be, I don't know, like spewing plastic bags when you sweat. It takes tons and tons to make a bag. Well, I've got a problem with this. I don't want to get the target in my bags. I'm like, what do you do? What do you well, you can, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> for a kid's party. Ooh, well for you, Andy. Name a price, we'll hang up, we'll hang up. whether it be more interior recycling in the home, whether it be artistic collaboration, um, 
person to get a lot. I think that there's a lot of other avenues, but I want to focus on this one because I want to draw awareness to the infrastructure that exists by doing it in tandem with the recycling at the grocery store. Right. So do you feel that by trading the momentum of some of the factory firms that they don't have a similar impact on the I think it's very possible um, because it's a pretty simple process. I think it would just be about getting someone there excited about this process. Uh, I hesitate only because there's a section of the uh, rise of interest recovery that handles plastic bags right now for the store. And they weren't very responsive in my initial outreach uh, to get research done. So I don't know if there's the right kind of person there. Mm -hmm. yeah, the last question. Oh. Sorry, so John, there's someone behind you who can't see who came. Uh, is it, is it Lindsay, you have a question? Oh, can I just yes. say actually, actually, this has to do with the Rhode Island recycling also. It seems like they have a big incentive to not have the bags in their trash stream because it's clogging up the works and it's costing them money. Um, did they, have you thought about or have they thought about creating a recycling container for plastic bags to, so that they could collect them, make money off them, and it would make their whole recycling process go better? So they have half of what you're talking about. So this retro system will provide boxes but that's all they are, corrugated little boxes, and then it's up to the responsibility of whoever obtains the boxes to deal with the plastic that they collect. So like, for instance, in this piece context, we have our facilities people drive all of the plastic bags that we collect, because we have six or seven bins on campus for this. Uh, we drive it on the whole routes, and then they recycle it there. So it's an imperfect system. They have like half of that solution, but I think it's a good one. So it's a little hard to track people once they're removed, but the validation that I got was, oh, I had no idea. I was like, do you get paid for this? There's sorts of uh, interactions on site. So I'm hopeful that I changed their minds. So now that we have about almost five minutes, oh. All right, so um, your energy is Um, and I very much enjoy it. I, I, I want to figure out how we can use you to give this message because I will tell you my question is loaded because I don't think you're going to find people like you who are going to be able to have the same impact that you can have. So is there another way? Is there video clips of you doing this? That can't you? <laughs> <laughs> situation and that is a gift. I don't think you can train people to have that same I just don't like, and I've been training people my whole life and you just can't train people to be engaging the way that you're engaging. Um, and approach you. I mean you are you're I don't want to say so I'm gonna say goofy but goofy in a good way. Um, that people don't find you um, to be anything less than approachable. And I don't think you can take treat you know, train recycling or whatever they might be called, to give that same impact. And people remember what you said to them because of the way they interacted with you. That, you got to figure out how to capture that and do it in other ways. So is it online? Is it visual? Is it however it might be? Is it, you know, your head popping up, you know, somewhere next to the wind, which would be kind of entertaining. But for me, it's like my comment is part of the success of this is you. Um, and I don't know that you can replicate that at the same level without finding somebody who has the same energy and passion for that. And making a like, picture of like a, an ad, like a Rhode Island, um, like, like an say. ad. Yeah, like, but like on like YouTube awesome. or something. And it's just like, did you know? Like, it's, and it's true, like your, your energy is, is amazing. Um, but I'm going back to Greg's point about one of the other um, presentations was there's totally grants where you could follow through doing some of this stuff. And it's something that's like it, advantageous for everybody. So I mean, if, if there's, I mean, if there's any thought of you continuing this, I would definitely encourage you to do that and to look into that because I do think that you could make money somehow. I don't know how, um, but just be really good. All right. 
Could show a picture of somebody recycling a plastic bag off the wall. It's true, but I had a circle board all day. Oh, yeah. And I pointed at the laser. Yeah. And I talked about <laughs> it. <laughs> the whole thing was about that. You didn't show it. But I was. Thank you. Tuesday, do you have an exhibition? 
So make sure uh, you have a plan. I ask Michael Simeka to help us to take the panel down so you're going to have a full space. Uh, just to think about the layout, the theme of your presentation as an exhibition. Not so much about just putting things on the top of your table, but you know, Andy has done that like uh, uh, exhibition for last year class. So you can always ask his opinion within his experience. At uh, same time, again, some of those are going to be there for a while until you graduate. So think about your plan, how you can also um, clean up later, but then how you can actually really make it uh, amazing. Right? So uh, if you have idea about presentation through like a video, how are you going to put the um, laptop or you know, display? It's going to be very difficult to do it for long uh, hours. So think about some of those plans more. And, um, and then we have a one-on-one. -on -one. We're going to set up the schedule. Uh, three of uh, this faculty need to come up with a plan, but that's the final one. And uh, two faculty are using the digital uh, online evaluation form. I'm using paper, so I need to meet you guys at some point. Maybe that will be a Tuesday. Right? So you need to talk about the class, but mostly talk about the teacher. And you have to make three forms. <laughs> So um, again, great job. Um, we have to make sure that we leave the space by 6.30. Uh, cleaning up is very important. Uh, also, we took a lot of equipment from the ID building, and some of your samples are still here, so let's be responsible. So great job. Thank you. Thank you.